Hello everybody and welcome back to the Minnesota Quick Hot Fix. This weekend we have a very special event planned for you. We're going to be showcasing a lot of the games in the Yakuza series. Before we get into any of it though, just a few quick reminders. Fran Fatales is Games Done Quick's all-women online speedrunning community. The upcoming event, Flame Fatales, will run from August 13th to 20th. The schedule is now out at gamesdunquick.com slash schedule. While you're checking out the schedule, feel free to submit a prize for the event. You can use exclamation FF in Twitch chat to submit your prizes. The last day to submit the prizes is going to be August. With that said, uh, we are starting up the marathon with Yakuza Zero. We've got uh, a bunch of people here. I'll let everybody introduce themselves. Hey everyone, I'm Big Nono, and I'm a Yakuza speedrunner. I speedrun a few of these games, uh, Kiwami, the PS2 games, and uh, now uh, Yakuza 0 as well. Um, and I'm just going to play a bit of Yakuza 0 myself, just because I feel like it. And I'm going to let my commentators uh, introduce themselves, so please, go ahead. I'm Petki, I'm also a runner of this game, and I will run K1 after this. Uh, I'm Firelight, I'm also a Yakuza speedrunner. Uh, I mainly run Zero and Kiwami. Uh, I'm through. I speedrun some of these games? Question mark? <laughs> yeah, every single one. I... Yep. Apart <laughs> from PSP games. Eventually. Oh, yeah. Question mark. Um, well, that's, that's enough Yakuza Zero practice for me. Uh, I think we can go ahead and begin. So, this is going to be... The any percent category for Yakuza Zero, which we run on uh, easy difficulty, uh, for the most part, there are really exception, exceptions, but uh, we can go on three, two, one, go. So three, two, one, go. So uh, the one thing you always have to start a Yakuza run with, unfortunately, is cutscene skips, which have gotten worse and worse in, this, in these games over the years. Used to be you would just hold the start button to skip a cutscene. Uh, now it's a whole thing of pause the cutscene, press confirm, mouse over to yes, confirm again. So whenever I, um, whenever I skip cutscenes, there's a lot of mashing. Thankfully, in every game since Yakuza 2, you can press R1 and confirm to skip the text automatically, so at least we're spared most of the mashing in these games outside of the cutscenes. Another unfortunate thing about starting most Yakuza games is that we have to start with a tutorial. The tutorials in these games are pretty difficult to optimize because they essentially want you to do a certain move a certain amount of times, and if you hit more than one enemy at the same time, it counts as multiple hits. So to be optimal, you really have to group up enemies very carefully, which I'm going to endeavor to do now with these light attacks. Um, okay, that's a good start. The really bad thing is that in Yakuza 0 specifically, these guys are spaced together very, very badly. And also, they're generally more aggressive than these than guys in these tutorials are in Yakuza games. Yeah, that guy just completely got away from me, which is unfortunate. Next up is a grab tutorial. The optimal thing here is to just do a light, light heavy. This is a, an animation that can get interrupted very easily, so we're a bit lucky here. Oh, yeah. Th this is the uh, Yakuza 0 tutorial experience, for sure. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, this is a real bad one. It should briefly be mentioned as well, the enemy that just went down had a red aura around him. Enemies can go into an aggro state like that and uh, get a little bit of hyper armor as well as just being even more aggressive. Yeah, that was uh, fairly disastrous, but it's all good. Uh, another thing about... This is specific to this game, Kiwami and Ishin. For some reason, they decided to introduce the stamina system in these games. And man, do you not get enough stamina. You have enough stamina to run for 7 seconds when you start out. We're going to get some upgrades for this, which are going to be important for various reasons. But starting out, it can be pretty frustrating. So, coming up here, we're going to get our second tutorial. And this one will introduce the heat system. So, Firelight, would you like to explain the heat system in these games? Yeah, of course. <clears throat> so, uh, there's going to be a little bar below our health bar, which is the heat bar. And we have three of those. Um, depending on the heat move that we want to use, uh, we either need the third heat bar or the second heat bar. 
And um, we fill this heat bar by doing attacks of any kind. Um, for example, just broader moves, but also weapons. And um, yeah, we are gonna get a small tutorial on how to use heat moves here. We can basically interact with the environment. And we will also see a small icon on the top right. Um, the small flame, which you will see in a second. Managed to grab him between the two text boxes. Good. That's uh, not something you can always do, but it's a nice time save when you can. Oh, yeah. oh got knocked down. That's that's hello. <laughs> oh my god. We are getting uh, quite quite the intro from this game. Um, okay. But yeah, uh, so as Firelight explained, Basically, heat moves. The more you do damage, the more your heat bar fills up. When your heat bar fills up, you can use it to do special attacks called heat moves. And we will be using heat moves a lot in this game because, especially in easy, they are very, very powerful. Right now, the game is going to introduce the upgrade system. And this is <laughs> when I first played this game casually, this is where I absolutely fell in love with the game because it's, it's so goofy and so simple, but that's what makes it so brilliant. So in previous Yakuza games, you would have your money, and separate from that, you would have experience points you get from combat. In Yakuza 0, there's no separation. Your money is also your experience and what you get when you attack enemies in combat. And it's it really nicely ties into the themes of the game. This game takes place in 1988 in Japan, during the bubble period of the economy. And it sort of feeds into this idea that during this time, money is everything that you are and everything that you have. And the game plays around with that in many, many ways. But yeah, this is actually going to be a thing throughout the run. We'll talk about this a bit more later. Um, managing your money and balancing it between buying equipment and buying abilities uh, is very, very important. All right, so we do have a bit of walking around to do now. Would uh, anyone like to describe the events of the start of this game? What's going on in the story right now? Sure. Uh, essentially, what's happening is the very start of the game starts with Ryu here, who's still a currently a member of the Sojo clan under the Dojima family, uh, doing a shakedown on somebody to get some money back that he obviously owes the Yakuza. Uh, but what Kiryu's just found out when we went to go get some ramen with our boy Nishiki uh, is that, unfortunately, the guy that he shook down has been found dead, which uh, Kiryu certainly didn't do that. So Kiryu is now, at this moment, trying to figure out what's going on, and he's just had a pager from the Dojima family lieutenants, specifically Kuze, Shibasawa, and Awano, who we're all going to get to meet now, and if you've ever seen this game, sure you'll know who, uh, who they are, especially Kuze, who you'll see very soon. Yeah, by the way, you can, as early as this part of the game, you can actually already get fight spawns here. Uh, most Yakuza games wait until chapter 2 before um, fight spawns become a thing. But yeah, the random battles that roam the map and try to get into a fight with you, we can get them from the very start. So we need to watch out for that. Yeah, this we will have a, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, we will have a way to deal with those fight spawns later on, but we'll describe why uh, we'll describe what that is. Zero is actually really nice and it's one of the Yakuza games that actually gives us something to be able to deal with enemy spawns. Mm hmm Yes. So yeah, that cutscene introduces the three lieutenants, which again when I first started playing this game, I thought these are all middle-aged guys in suits. There's no way that these are the guys we fight, but sure enough. Uh, that's kind of the recurring theme of the entire Yakuza series. You fight middle-aged guys in suits. What can you do? Uh, so the entire the, the two tutorial we got so far used the um, first fighting cell of Kiryu. That was an awkward way of saying that sentence. Kiryu's fa first fighting cell, which is called Brawler. Brawler is a very balanced cell. It's got decent speed, decent damage. And now we're getting introduced to the second cell, which is called Rush. And this is done through a mechanic from earlier games called Revelations. Revelations are these uh, events where Kiryu sees something happening on the street and for some reason learns how to do super specific and super situational heat move from them. 
And Yakuza 0 just reappropriates those revelations for the uh, fighting style tutorials. And this is Rush. Rush is <laughs> nowhere near as cool as the game makes it look right now. Uh, would, um, well, maybe we could get to that in a moment. First of all, for our Rush tutorial, we are going to face this big man called Bruno, who is the bane of every Yakuza speedrunner, uh, Yakuza 0 speedrunner specifically. He is thankfully not in any of the other Yakuza games. So, right away. Sorry. So, um, Rush is basically a high power, uh, no, wrong, <laughs> low power, high speed fighting style, and it's not good because yeah. it barely does any damage. Unfortunately, Bruno decided not to behave. With Bruno, he gets up off the ground really fast. So what we ideally would like to do is hit him into one of the walls, which is what we tried to bait him into doing. Rush can't do, uh, like, certain heat attacks. Like, every different style has different heat attacks it can do. Every single tutorial like this one, uh, enemies go down a lot faster if you can do a heat attack. But sometimes Bruno, uh, like a few times, Bruno like that, will just not behave, and that's why we dislike Bruno. Yeah, the, the idea is, if you can get behind Bruno and just combo him to the ground, you can immediately do a heat move on him, which finishes him off, like Froob said. Uh, I just couldn't get any purses on him. Um, yeah, Bruno is a big, big reset point for this run. And that's kind of a recurring theme of Chapter 1. This game is actually not too bad once you get a run going, once you get to Chapter 2 and especially 3. But uh, getting past this chapter can take a lot of doing. <sighs> so yeah, at this point, um, we are going. We are heading over to Toko Credit, which uh, the chairman of Toko Credit is the person we performed the shakedown for in the beginning of the game. And we are going to see what happened, why the guy we didn't kill is dead, and try to see, try to uh, get some info out of here. Which, uh, of course, as is par for the course for a Yakuza game, leads to us having a talking to you with these nice gentlemen. Who don't really want to give us the time of day. They're going to be very rude towards us. So immediately, we're going to switch off of Rush back to Brawler. So the combo we use most of the time with Brawler is this four hit combo. Just because the last hit has a really wide swing. So if we manage to group enemies together, it's a very, very nice way to try and um, get multiple KOs with one combo, which is really important for being optimal in this game. For example, we have... I, I hope these guys are... Okay, this is nice. See, these guys are packed together and they kind of get knocked into each other from the force of the combo. And uh, yeah, that was a pretty good Toko credit, all in all. Yeah, that was a nice gather up at the end. Okay, so um, does anyone like to continue with the story explanation until we get to the Dojima family office? Essentially, we went to Toko Credit to see the loan shark who we got the money back for, and we met Kuze there, and Kuze, being all Kuze, uh, decides to taunt Kiryu a little bit, uh, and essentially, he, we, we get a pager from Nishiki, and Kiryu has basically decided he's going to go to Dojima HQ, and basically enter his resignation from the Yakuza, if that makes any sense. Uh, on the way, we're going to be going to the actual local shop because in terms of speed tech, this actually helps to do this now because in Chapter 2, uh, this uh, shopkeeper is going to become a friend event and it's just going to add a bunch more dialogue. So doing this now so that we can actually like, save a little bit of time later on. bit of speed tech here I stole from a runner of the game by the name of Yuki who actually ran this game on keyboard and mouse. Weird thing with shop menus in this game, for some reason, you can't, if you're at the top of the menu and you press up, it doesn't go to the bottom on PC, even though it does on console. Um, for some reason, with the mouse wheel, it does work that way. And I don't know if that's a console versus PC thing or if it's because I'm using an Xbox controller. Anyway, that saves a bit of time of having to scroll all the way down. You could just cycle straight up. And we use that in a bunch of shop menus in the game. Uh, weirdly, it did work for one patch, and then it stopped working again, <laughs> so we're not quite sure why. 
interesting little side fact, if you look at Nishki's number plate here, it says 241K, which uh, stands for Nishki actually, because uh, if you translate that to Japanese, 2 stands for Ni, 4 can be pronounced as Shi, and K obviously is K. Oh, which I thought is pretty funny. When you said you want to mention that, I didn't really know what you were talking about. That's interesting. Uh, yeah. Okay, so this guy on the left is called Yoneda. He is very nasty. I want to grab him right away. Very nice. So, um, we, we forgot to talk about this. Not only do you get money from beating enemies in this game, but you actually get bonuses for how fast or the different ways in which you can beat them. And specifically beating an enemy with a heat move and doing it quickly gives you a really nice bonus, which we use to immediately learn our first um, damage buff of the game, Power Surge 1, which is the only reason why this fight uh, goes fairly quickly. Uh, Power Surge 1 is actually a really nice... Oh, that's not good. <laughs> it's actually a really nice damage buff. Bit of wonky physics here with these guys. But yeah, as you can see, we keep uh, trying to group these guys up. Really, really important. Um, be optimal in this game. And Return of Yoneda. We'll have two fights with Yoneda where he basically charges with us and we have a QTE for him. Then to finish him off, I need to kind of carefully... Oh, nice. Carefully position myself so that my combo is not too early that it misses him, but not too late that he can block it. And that, that animation right there where you just pancake him into the ground, that's optimal. That's very good. All right, heat move to get rid of the sofa guy. Another QTE for Yonena, which luckily this time will just stay down. We don't have to do anything with him, but we do have to deal with this dude. Also, I run a bit forward to trigger these three guys so that while I take care of the three guys behind us, they will already um, be out of the way. Right here, Yoneda is going to come through again. Hopefully we can get two for two. And this is th this is more about timing than it is about positioning, but you also want to be positioned more to his back because from the front he can, he can block earlier, so your um, timing is a bit less sensitive if your positioning is good. All right, got to take care of these two guys, which is very confusing because we'll be back here later in the run and we won't have to defeat the enemies on the stairs. So when, when you, whenever you de-rust this game, it's very confusing if you actually have to fight those guys. All right, the bathroom here. The bathroom is uh, really a place that can make or break your chapter one. These guys can either really group up nicely like they do now that was pretty good um, and can save you a lot of time here or they can be complete bastards but uh, no that was pretty nice and here's Yoneda this is the last time we'll fight this man I will start this fight with four hit combo then a three hit combo oh, oh no oh no okay Whew. easy there he tried his best to screw wow. you up there uh, that's something we never mentioned about Brawl, but I'll mention really quickly. Uh, when Nono got hit there, uh, the red flash was a counter. You can like slightly counter with Brawler with like a light strong or a grab, which obviously helps get your needed to hopefully pull right? Yes. And you probably think, okay, th this guy's definitely dead after getting uh, kicked out of the top floor like that. Actually, no. You actually see him later in the game in a cutscene. We just don't fight him again. Um... Everyone always makes fun of, you know, Kiryu never killed anyone. Proof's in the pudding. I mean, these guys just survived. What can I say? All right. And we are up to our first, first boss fight. This is Kuze 1, which is not the only time we're going to be fighting Kuze, hence the name Kuze 1. Uh, there's a very specific script for this fight. First of all, it's a very good thing he went off to the side because that makes it easier to get him towards the wall. We want two combos here. That's not the heat move I want. I pressed the triangle way too early. Cool. That is unfortunate. Yeah. Um, combo here to... Yeah, I'm going to have to do some extra damage here. Combo to bait out a block. So we can actually heat move him again. And another stomp, and this should trigger his QTE. Very nice. 
Now more stomp to get him back up quicker and also get more damage out. He's being very uncooperative. Um, I hope this is enough. We might have to do a bit more extra damage. Yeah, okay. Unfortunate, but it is what it is. It was a good recovery, all things considered. Yeah, could have been worse. And that's Kuzay 1, and that is the end of the first chapter. So, does uh, anyone want to give a quick recap of the events of um, after we beat Kuzay? And what we're going to be doing in Chapter 2, story-wise? Yeah, essentially, uh, we get to the top floor of Dojima HQ, we meet everybody involved, so obviously again, Kuze, Shibasa, Awano, and uh, Tohei Dojima himself, the, the head of that family and one of the lieutenants of the Sojo clan. Uh, Kiryu tenders his resignation and is basically a civilian now, uh, at which point, obviously, Kuze has to undergo, you know, the thing that they have to do because, you know, he kind of stepped out of line, but as Kiryu's kind of walking around upset, not sure what to do, no clearer on, obviously, who killed the guy in the empty lot, uh, he meets a real estate agent who goes by the name of Tachi Banner, who basically takes him off to where he's staying and basically says, hey, I'd like you to join me, and with this chapter, we're now just going to kind of start confusedly walking around trying to figure out what's going on and whether we want to like actually work with Tachi Banner and also figure out who they are as well. Yes, and uh, as you saw, we um, the fight spawns are really all over the place right now, and it's actually really scary to um, have one that's pretty close to you at this point in the game because we are still on base stamina. So running away from them is a bit of a challenge, but we're going to actually get something that mitigates this later in the chapter. Either way, before the next part, I'm actually going to uh, switch the difficulty to hard. So this is any percent, and it... Oh, that's a really... Okay, that's fine. I thought that would be a worse fight spawn than it actually was. So this is any percent, and any percent is, to be optimal, mostly run on easy. But there's actually a couple of parts where it uh, behooves us to be on hard. And this is one of them. This is Mr. Shakedown. He is um, a nuisance throughout this run. Basically, this is a fight we're supposed to... Wow. <laughs> I have never seen that. Me neither. Rube? Nope. <laughs> uh, okay. That helps because of being on hard. Wow. So, uh, okay. So, Mr. Shakedown is an enemy who... He basically roams the map. And if you get into a fight with him and lose, it's not game over, but he does take away all of your money. And um, obviously for our run, it's really, really bad. We want to avoid that as much as possible. But that initial fight with Mr. Shakedown, you're not supposed to win it and you don't get anything extra for winning it. We'll see a similar fight in Yakuza Kiwami later, which Padki will run that we actually do want to win, but there's no benefit to winning that fight. So basically what we do is we change the difficulty to hard, just so we get out of that fight faster. Usually what happens is you will grab Mr. Shakedown, and he will do enough damage, and once you get up, the game just calls the fight. Uh, but, but that... that I've never seen that one before. Apparently that works as well, so that was <laughs> good RNG? Question mark? I've been running this game for six years and modding the board for that long, I have never seen that fight end in that exact way, nor that fast. There's usually only one way for that fight to end like that fast, and that's for Shakedown to grab you, but the chances of him grabbing you is like 10% or something like silly. Like, it's really low. So that, that's an amazing way for it to end. I thought his dodges were going to cause you problems. Yeah, same. same. We, we, we actually managed to find something even sillier, I guess. That's, uh, put that on your bingo cards for the run, I guess. Uh, that, that never happened before to anyone, apparently. So, continuing on the shop we did in Chapter 1, we, we need to get uh, a whole bunch of items for later in the run. Um, there is some, some uh, drinks involved and also a confection gift box. Ooh, that's a very close... Fight spawn. 
Ooh, these guys, these guys are going for it. Okay, we're going to do two more shops in this chapter. Uh, anyway, man, what a run. Uh, this is another uh, fighting style introduction, and this one will actually introduce the the only fighting style we'll use for damage in the run, mostly except for like one little exception. Uh, this is Beast, and this is Miss Tatsu. Miss Tatsu is pretty awesome. She's going to show off some of the moves we're going to be using in Beast, including this one heat move coming up that we can only use in the game as a counter, but she can just use it at will, so we, we will never be as cool as Miss Tatsu. But uh, we can try. She's my favorite uh, fighting instructor in the entire series, and also her training is really fun. Sadly, it's not really all that useful in and of itself, so we don't learn it during the run. Even all sub-story runs don't uh, go anywhere near here, as far as I know. But yeah, Miss Tatsu um, is herself shaking down um, someone who owes, owes some debts, and uh, a bunch of his friends show up, and they plan to um, surprise attack her. So we come to the rescue. By the way, uh, pay attention especially to the guy in the turtleneck because he's going to be... Uh, we're going to see more of him later. Anyway, this uh, this uh, tutorial introduces auto attacks, which uh, unlike other fighting styles in Beast, you can actually just attack and pick up weapons as you go. Um, this is also the part, the first time the game teaches you how to block after the first boss fight. Being on hard is supposed to make this go faster, but, but I mean, not not in this case. The game just does not want to play along. But yeah, the moment you're... Sorry, go ahead. Um, so, now no, we get an upgrade called uh, Golden Fist now, which uh, gives us more damage if we are uh, in the third heat bar. Um, and yeah, you will see in the late game, that's an absurd amount of damage. Yeah, and this is on hard. You're not supposed to just one-shot things on this difficulty, but with Golden Fist, everything is possible. And a lot of um, a lot of our strats in this game are going to be based on wanting to... Because Golden Fist only goes into effect when you're on the third heat bar, on the highest level of the heat bar, so we're going to want to stay there for as much as possible. Also, this is where I really... <laughs> I really need to remember to switch to easy, or the next fight is going to be very long. Uh, so yes, at this point in the run, Kiryu is continuing to go around looking for clues about Tachibana, um, what Tachibana in real estate is doing in the city. Oh, okay, that, that was bound to happen eventually. All the things that have not been happening in practice are happening now. This is some classic marathon luck. So you you usually just grab that guy and heat move him against the wall. Very, very rarely he will break out of the grab and counter you like that. And uh, just had to happen on just had to happen on the marathon. No other way that could have happened. Um, you can do a heat move immediately when you grab that guy, and that will finish him off as well. But the heat move that you do from the neutral position will take you down to the second heat bar, and we want to stay on the third heat bar for the next fight, again for maximum damage. That's actually a really nice fight spawn. One thing we haven't explained yet is that, unlike some of the previous... I, I think actually this is the game that introduced this. Uh, in previous Yakuza games, you can only... Oh, that's a bad fight spawn. Nah, that is a bad one. Alright, I'm gonna have to do something here. Ah, very outplayed. Nice. Hmm? Outplayed. Chapter 2 is very notorious for its bad fight spots, as you can see. Yeah. Sorry, uh, so as I was saying, you can, um, in this game and from this game onwards, you can only get aggroed onto by one fight spawn at a time. So if there's a fight spawn uh, tagging you from behind, it will prevent you from getting aggroed onto by fight spawns in more um, awkward positions. So it actually would have been nice if the fight spawn that was chasing us before 
would have continued chasing us a bit longer, but it's all good. We have our ways. Uh, this guy's name is Lee Lewoon, Le I think. Uh, or Conspiratorial Man, according to the subtitles. And this is the beginning of a sub-story that we're actually never going to finish, but as part of that sub-story... Also, for those who don't know, uh, sub-stories are just the Yakuza term for side quests. And that sub-story in particular is going to give us a very, very important item a bit later in this chapter. So, yeah, Fru, do you want to continue explaining what's happening in the plot at this point? Cool. So we're carrying on with looking into the Touch Banner Real Estate and we come to this property here around this part of town. Uh, this part of town is very, very important. And we meet someone in that cutscene there, the person who's holding all the money called Oda. He is one of the big workers at Touch Banner Real Estate. He's kind of like the second in command. Uh, we see that he is trying to buy the plot of land from the owner and Tatch Banner is basically using these homeless folk here to basically be squatters to try and force the owner out but the owner kind of with the CD underbelly of everything going on is basically trying to squeeze Tatch Banner out of more money and even he himself has his limit but with that we've learned a bit more about odor and how Tatch Banner works and we're now just gonna go to find some more homeless guys so we can get some more information about Tatch Banner real estate. Yes, which is what we're actually going to do right here. I need to not run out of stamina, otherwise those guys will catch me. So, talking to these guys, we overhear that a bunch of the homeless people working with Tachibana are going to be in Public Park 3, which we are going to go to presently, but not before we do some more shopping. We're going to go into a couple of the shops here and get uh, the three remaining items we need for this part. Uh, the fun fact about the remaining items in in terms of the scotch whiskey and the champagne that's going to get picked up here, uh, both of those are in the dream machines that you can see around town. Uh, the champagne is in the cheaper of the, t uh, the two, uh, which is the 10,000 dream machine, and the scotch whiskey is in the 1 million. Uh, with the cheaper 10,000 one, it's a 1 in 16 chance, and with the 1 million one, it's a 1 in 13 chance. That's why we don't try it. Plus, with how tight money is at first, that million would be quite a big hit towards, obviously, upgrades and other stuff. The thing, too, with Dream Machines, which I actually forgot about until my very recent casual playthrough, is it's random whether or not they're active, and it's also random what the value is for each one. So we can never yeah. just rely on them being active. Like on, on top of the RNG of what you get, there's the RNG of if you get the dream machine you want. Uh, but yeah, at this point, these guys here say that uh, they they will not tell us anything unless we give them, um, yeah, unless we get them a bunch of drinks, which casually a lot of people. Um, get upset at this part because at this point if you play the game casually you come here you realize you have to buy a bunch of stuff for these guys and it basically sends you all over the map uh, I, I've come to be uh, a bit more forgiving of this I kind of like that the game you know it isn't just for progress constantly that it kind of forces you to get to know the city and walk around a bit um, but yeah it, it can be kind of frustrating when you play this for the first time also, you get an achievement if you give the one guy who wants champagne a gold champagne. Oh yeah, that's right. And the way I talk to these guys, there's a bit of a cooldown between um, between times you're able to talk to them, and for each one you talk to them once uh, just to hear what they want, and then a second time to actually give them the drink they want. So I'm just trying to optimize that. I uh, or or maybe I would just completely whiff. Talking to this yeah, last the guy. Yeah, so weird. Yeah. Uh, who did I? Oh, I actually forgot this guy. Okay. And yeah, I I don't necessarily, I can't necessarily promise what I do is the most optimal thing, but I think uh, it saves you a bit of time. Either way, at this point, these guys um, point us in the direction of. Champion District. 
we are going to head there. And we're actually going to do a bunch of... We're going to take care of a bunch of errands on the way. First of all, Bacchus is going to um, tell us to come here. And th that's where uh, Bacchus teaches you techniques for the brawler style. However, brawler is barely going to be used in this run. And nothing that Bacchus teaches you is really that useful. That's kind of a big criticism of the game for me, is that a lot of the extra abilities you learn from trainers for the fighting styles, both for Kiryu and Majima, aren't actually very good. But yeah, uh, so what we got there is the first stamina upgrade for Kiryu. So you begin the game with enough stamina to run for 7 seconds. And for every second that you don't run, you recover one second of dash. So it's one to one, completely linear. If you get the first stamina upgrade, that increases to 10 seconds of a dash. The difference is that you actually um, regain your stamina at a higher rate. Hold on. Uh, this fight here is part of the sub story we started earlier. This move is called the Heat Swing. I actually was not on my third heat bar, probably because I got knocked around a bit by... Uh, by uh, the guy we fought earlier. This is uh, unfortunate. So yeah, because I wasn't on the third heat bar, the heat swing didn't actually do enough damage to finish everyone off. So that took longer than it would have otherwise. Unfortunate. But yeah, basically the idea of the stamina upgrade, the, the most important thing about the stamina upgrade, I should say, is that we regain stamina at a much higher rate which allows us to sort of stop and start running while still building up distance from whatever fight spawn is chasing us, which makes it much, much easier to get away from those fights. Mm. Okay, so, um, would you like to continue talking about the story at this point? Sure. We basically come down to the champion district here, where these guys are basically here to kind of test Kiryu a little bit. Um, they're actually going to be members of Tachibana Real Estate. We're going to meet Oda a little bit after this, who's going to be all like, Hey, why don't you come over to Tachibana's place and we'll have a nice little chat in quotation marks. Yeah, and Heat Swing gets rid of those guys very, very quickly. On an earlier route, this fight would actually... We would actually go do this fight before the sub-story fight. But it, it turns out that taxiing up to the northeastern taxi station and running down here is about as fast as walking here. And it makes uh, these fights much, much more... M much nicer. Because we don't have to conserve heat for anything coming up. Because coming up, we're actually going to have a very good way of uh, getting all of our heat um, instantly. And we'll see that in a moment. Yeah, this is Oda inviting us back to the office. And right here, I need to make sure that I go north and not south because muscle memory is a thing. The nice thing about going through this part as well is that if you if you see a fight spawn here, you can kind of go around one of the buildings within Champion District and... Oops. And, um... Yeah, that, that way avoid it more carefully. Uh, sorry, more easily. By the way, the reason I bumped into that fight spawn is related to what I said earlier, since you can only have one fight spawn aggro on you at any time. Sometimes it's good to activate one just in case there's a more annoying one later on that you would want to circumvent. Either way, this is almost the end of this sub-story. This is the last part that we're going to do by giving Lee here the right answers. Uh, after that fight, we get a shotgun. And shotguns are going to be very, very important in this run. We are going to use them for all the fights against regular enemies. And the importance of ha having one shotgun is fine. But getting this one shotgun will actually allow us to get a lot more later on. And we'll see... Um, 
We'll see what that means a bit later. Okay, here we are at Tachibana Real Estate, where we started the chapter. And we have a bit of a welcoming party. There is certain character models in Yakuza games that, that you just know these are guys that you're going to fight. Like you, you have like three, four guys that are just the regular enemy in fights. And once you see these guys, you know something's going to go down. Luckily, this is going to go very, very quickly. Yeah, with all strats, these fight used to be a pain in the backside because we use beast and a table to the right hand side, and it would all be about hoping the enemy gather up. But thankfully, shotgun good. The table still gets used in the gambling world, but that will be later. All right, so Ooh, right. All we have to do is hop back just to um, line enemies up a bit better. There's um, even though, as you saw, shotguns are very, very good, to really be optimal with using the shotgun, you kind of need to understand how the cone of fire works. And it actually works a bit uh, differently between this game and Kiwami, as we'll see later. But yeah, that, that hop back just allows you to get more enemies in your uh, line of fire. So from being a fight that typically takes three shots to get through, it becomes a fight that only takes two and sometimes even just one. So looking at that, you might think that shotguns make um, combat in this game a bit boring. Again, there's this whole aspect of positioning to it that makes it uh, a bit more interesting, in my opinion. But what really prevents it from uh, making the fights too simple is that bosses and mini bosses barely take any damage from shotguns and guns in general. So for Oda, who's this fight's boss, uh, who's this fight's boss? Sorry, this chapter's boss fight. We're actually going to have to do something a bit different. And this fight used to be pretty different, um, but. I'm going to use the technique here that I learned from the Ultimate Climax Battles speedrun, which is these overhead attacks with furniture, for some reason, just do an unbelievable amount of damage. And once once uh, we started using this, it just started saving so much time in the run. And this is a really... These moves save a good amount of time in any percent on the Legend run. Uh, they just... They just shaved off minutes of the run. It's really, really good. Uh, but yeah, a bunch of those, and Oda is down for the count. And we are down, done with Kiryu for now. Yakuza 0 transitions every two chapters between Kiryu and the other protagonist, Majima. And we are uh, getting a bit of an introduction from Majima here. So, Fru, would you like to describe this tutorial? Yeah, so unfortunately, we are at the whim of this guy's AI and how aggressive he is. He has a couple of moves that he can throw out, and because we are in Cabaret Grand, and the story behind Majima is that we are obviously the head of the Grand, we do not attack people in the Grand. We are hoping to see certain attacks uh, at certain points. If he does a charge forward there between the first phase and the second phase of this fight, it actually registers as two attacks and you can get out this first heat attack immediately. But this heat attack is all based on obviously his aggression. We need him to attack us for both the dodging and obviously the heat attack. If we're on a harder difficulty, it's a lot more consistent because obviously his aggression is made higher. We usually know how we're doing via the crescendo here. Good crescendo, love that piece of music. Um, but you want to be at least, if you're not in the cutscene for that last heat attack when that, that crescendo hits, you've had a bad tutorial, sadly, but that seemed okay. Yeah, that was decent. Nothing special, but that was okay. Um, it, it would probably have been good to do that fight on hard as well, but then you would have to do the Oda fight on hard, which would just take much, much longer. So it wouldn't be worth it. But yeah, that entire tutorial is kind of a kind of a troll tutorial because it doesn't really teach you anything about Majima's fighting. Um, for people who know, for longtime fans of the series who know Majima as this very violent, very madcap kind of character, you expect when you see him walking down to just immediately destroy this guy, and then it just shows you a tutorial where nothing violent actually takes place, at least not from Majima's side. 
Taco. It's a uh, pretty, a pretty nice subverting of expectations. Uh, Froob, you were, I think of all of us, you're the only one who was already a fan of the series when you played this game. Uh, how, how did you feel about this portrayal of Majima? Yeah, I started off see the original on PS2 back when it originally released. Um, I actually don't mind this version of Majima because I think one of the big important themes of Majima in this game is his growth. Like, this is obviously the only time you see Majima kind of pre this game is kind of the flashbacks in Yakuza 4, which we'll more about that tomorrow. Um, but the nice thing is with this Majima, he's kind of, he's having to be a bit more humble. He's having to obviously not fight back because if he does, it's going to end up getting him hurt. And it's just a kind of really nice way of seeing his growth into the Majima that everybody knows obviously with the later games. You'll meet a couple of characters later on in this run, actually, that very much directly influences Majima. Yeah, it's a, it's a really nice touch. And in general, what's really nice about Yakuza 0 is it's a good place to start with the series. It's uh, I would absolutely say every time this is the game you should start with if you want to get into the Yakuza series. But if you replay it later, after having gone through the entire series, it, it really puts the whole game in a different light, and Majima's character in particular. So it, um, yeah, there, there's a really nice interplay there. Anyway, coming up here is our actual first combat tutorial. This introduces Majima's uh, equivalent of Brawler, the balanced fighting style called Thug. And Thug has some nice moves. This counter move right here, which... Uh, totally does not does not kill anyone. Don't worry about it. Quick stomp here just to get Kumaki back up, knock him back down again, and this heat move should heal the deal. Nice. Yeah, that was pretty good. Um, so hope you enjoyed that because we're never going to see Thug again in the entire run. Much like yeah, uh, much like uh, Kiryu's brawler. It's just, it's it's no match to um, one of Majima's other fighting styles that will be a bit later. So, would anyone like to give a recap of what we're doing here in this uh, other cabaret called Odyssey? Yeah, so one of the one of the people that we met in one of the cutscenes uh, from the Grand was a guy called Sagawa. He's basically the guy who's basically taking charge and telling Majima what to do and making his job as hard as possible. Uh, Majima has been tasked with earning a certain amount of money for the Yakuza, and then he will be able to he'll be able to quotation marks be free. He'll be able to go back to what he wants to do afterwards. Go back to the Tojo, um, but to, by doing this, uh, Sagawa is really making it hard for Majima by taking away the best hostesses from the Grand. So he's gone to their local rivals, the Odyssey, their biggest ones, and now Majima's going to try and see what's going on here at the club and to try and also take their top talent away so they can join his cabaret. And this is a very exciting part of the run. Uh, sadly, we don't have as much keyboard and mouse support as we would like in this game. Um, we'll, we'll regret that later. But for that part specifically, in, in general, in uh, first person mode, you can use the mouse. So that allows you to get through that part a bit faster. The actual like camera control, as Big Nono was saying there, uh, if you use a dual shock instead of an Xbox controller, for some reason, there's extra sensitivity to it. So you literally look around the room way faster, which you'd think, oh, faster is good. Not in this situation. Not at all. Because it's really hard to actually look at the actual people that you need to look at. Because there is one person you can look in that club that you don't want to look at, and his name is Mr. Libido, and you will see him later on. And the less, the less looking at that guy, the better. Um, but yeah... This, they're actually the things you need to look at are actually pretty um, close together, so medium sensitivity is recommended. I have my my mouse on lower sensitivity than I would have, for example, for a first version shooter or anything like that. Okay, so after all that, Majima goes up to Sodenbury Street to look for um, for some dinner. And at this point, we're actually going to be introduced to Majima's second fighting style. However, before that, I need to be on the lookout for Mr. Shakedown, because unlike Kiryu, Majima's Mr. Shakedown doesn't get any special introduction. He just 
immediately pops up. The game just assumes that you're, you're already familiar with the concept of a Mr. Shakedown. And unlike regular fight Sword spawns... looking down there. Yeah. And unlike regular fight spawns, regular fight spawns have a certain radius where they can show up um, when you load into an area. Mr. Shakedown does not obey those rules. By the way, this is the turtleneck guy I pointed out earlier. I, I don't know if this is supposed to be really the same guy or if it's just a generic grunt character model. I do like, however, the idea of th this guy going around Japan just getting destroyed by different weapon masters all over. But yeah, this uh, second cell is called Slugger. A lot of people think Slugger is very cool. Uh, however, um, Slugger is bad. And we might see why it's bad very soon. I uh, actually did a run earlier today and Slugger betrayed me at every turn. And here we'll have Kameki showing up again and um, asking us to face Feihu, who's the guy we saw down by the river. And he's going to be our style master for Lugger. By the way, check out the dog in the dog house. And now the dog is gone. Dead. Alright, so we switch off to Slugger. And we start blocking. I always love the block tutorials in these games because uh, you, you are just completely at the mercy of AI. It's very fun. Alright, so here's the problem with Slugger. Slugger does decent damage, however, it's all concentrated in the last hit, as you saw right there. So if your last attack gets interrupted, which is easy to do because the last attack is... And there's the dog back, by the way. Um, if it's interrupted, and that's pretty easy to do because it's very slow, then you lose all of your damage. Another way you can lose your damage is if your attack gets bonked off of a wall. Uh, Slugger has these really, really wide swings to it, and if you, it's very easy, easy to hit a wall, and if that happens, you barely do any damage, and it's very, very frustrating. So you really don't want to use Slugger in any type of close quarters combat. Gee, I hope there's no fight coming up where that's the case. That would be a shame. But yes, uh, other than being your style master, this uh, shop also um, is used for a mechanic called Weapon Search. And Weapon Search is how you get most of your gear in the game. Most weapons and equipment will not show up of their own in the game. You have to actually send agents out and find them. However, if you find any weapons out in the wild by any chance, uh, you can always get them from Dragon and Tiger immediately, which does tie in... Um, something we talked about earlier, but we'll say more about that in the next chapter. We need that mechanic, the, um, the equip and search mechanic. We need to get that tutorial as soon as possible. Again, for reasons we'll talk about a bit later. But yeah, having done all of that, we are done for today and Majima is ready to come back home. But uh, these guys from Odyssey catch us before we can go upstairs. These guys were sent by Odyssey's manage uh, sorry, Odyssey's owner. Who um, we we struck a deal with Odyssey's manager to get some of his talent over to the Grand. But these guys don't agree to it. It's like that myth of consent um, <laughs> meme. So they are very very upset and they uh, want to teach us a lesson. And the extent to which they will be able to depends on how much I will be betrayed by Slugger again. Right here, I'm going to just do this one combo. That's not too bad. Looks like this will be a two. Yeah, two combo fight. Nice. Nice. Good hell. Yeah. Nice, yeah. Yeah, I always complain about Slugger, and then <laughs> the game, when it's an actual run that people see, it's um, it, 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 none of the things I say could happen, could go wrong, actually transpire. Um, 
I mean, I, I would complain also if things did go wrong. I would complain about marathon luck. So I guess I would complain either way. It's just the way it is. But yeah, that is the end of chapter three. And coming up at the beginning of chapter four, we're going to be introduced to some events from actually from Yakuza Zero. Uh, sorry, from Yakuza Four, which is going to be um, shown tomorrow. And does anyone want to say a few words about that? And uh, yeah, about Yakuza Four or about the cutscenes? The cutscenes, <laughs> Yakuza Four. I, I won't force you to talk about Yakuza Four two days in a row. That's too much. Oh, I'm not looking forward to it. <laughs> but the in regards to the cutscenes, uh, the cutscenes are basically set before uh, the events of this game. Um, they're a cool little thing if you've obviously played Yakuza 4, like if you were in the series before Zero came out, uh, where you basically see Majima and his Kyodai, his brother Saijima, uh, and there is basically, you don't get to see it in this game, you'll get to see it in Yakuza 4. There's basically a hit that they're both trying to do for the Yakuza. Things end up obviously going wrong, and that's how Majima ends up losing his eye. So you get a little bit of the background behind that without the full reveal from Yakuza 4. And it's basically just scenes that keep kind of haunting Majima, and you won't find out what happens to his brother Saijima until Yakuza 4. So here Majima gets told that uh, Sagawa wants to talk to him, and yeah, that's the face I make when I have to talk to my boss as well. Uh, Sagawa <laughs> wants to meet us in Ashitaba Park, which is actually a really nice location, got a really, got a really uh, interesting layout to it. Weirdly enough, in this game that takes place in 88, uh, you have Ashitaba Park, and you have Ashitaba Park in Yakuza 5 as well, uh, but for some reason it disappears for Yakuza 2, even though it's between the... Oh, I don't know what that's about. Yeah. <laughs> Construction work. <laughs> yeah, th there was some... They, they, re uh, re they renovated Ashitaba Park for a few years in the 2000s, apparently. Majima Construction had a sidekick. <laughs> oh no. Uh, okay, this is also where we need to start really watching out for sub-stories as well. Um, so, obviously you want to avoid any of the optional fights on the map, because those take up a lot of time if you get into them. But take a look on the left there. That's a sub-story. And there are a lot of sub-stories in this game that are triggered by you just walking into a certain area of the map. So you really got to be careful not to not to do that. So sometimes you'll see me taking very convoluted lines to get places. And the reason for that is usually to avoid a fight spawn. Because if you're too close to this corner, then you get a whole a whole uh, introduction to the sub story that takes like 20 seconds. Oh, beautiful. This happened to me earlier. OK, so I was supposed to go in there and get Majima's stamina upgrades. But uh, the game the game does not want us to do that right now, so we'll just get those upgrades a bit later. That's a shame that's going to lose a bit of time coming up, but um, it, it just takes too long to circumvent that fight and go to the, um, to the shrine anyway. So, um, yeah, anyone wants to talk about what our meeting with Sagawa was about, what we're going to do in this next part? So uh, Majima basically has been told that uh, he has to kill uh, a person called uh, Makimura Makoto uh, because that person is apparently a, a very bad man and um, now he's going to do some research this telephone club if he can find out something about uh, him. Yes, so... Apparently, uh, Makimura Makoto has a network of uh, telephone club girls working for him. And we managed to talk to one and get them to agree to meet us for a date. So we are headed there right now. We would get there a bit faster if I had my stamina upgrades, but Yakuza Zero said no. Oh, look, it's Mr. Shaken. And very nice yeah, about... Oh, by the way, right here you see one of my favorite signs in the game, fish or die. You also have Pizza Ni, or Pizza New York, uh, where you can get either pizza or spaghetti. And the, oh, sir. the pizza places that, that do spaghetti, for some reason, I don't know, I, I'm always very suspicious of those. You never get good spaghetti from them. Uh, 
Um, either way, this is Akko, the woman we talked to in the telephone club. And she basically agrees to give us information about Makimura Makoto um, in exchange for a date. So, uh, yeah, it's on, on now. So, first of all, we need to get her some sushi. So we're going to run over there. During this entire part, Mr. Shakedown isn't on the map. Fight spawns aren't on the map. Uh, sub stories aren't on the map. This this is the freest you ever feel <laughs> during uh, this game. This is the most gonna, fun. Hmm? I was going to mention briefly um, the scary part about Shakedown being uh, where he was just then. You need a minimum of fifty thousand yen to be able to start this story point, which in terms of Yakuza Zero money isn't a lot. But obviously, if you lose that money, we then lose an upgrade that we can get ahead of time. So you do not want to get into Shakedown in that bit at all. Yes. And he can spawn in one very awkward place on the way to get into the bridge, but thankfully he was going a good way today. Mori's map is a lot smaller than you than Kamurocho, so you see shake down a lot more. Oh, bunch of Yeah, I was gonna say th this is going to be very difficult for me. So for the next part of the date, Akko wants you to get her uh, something from the UFO catcher, which we don't want to do because if you catch something successfully. Um, it actually loses like 10 to 15 seconds. Man, this is hard though, because I love Bunchon. <laughs> it, it's it's taking every fiber of my being to not want to catch one of these guys. I recently... There was recently talk about... I, I think RGG is actually making a real life uh, Bunchon plush, which I will do the most obscene things imaginable to get my hands on one of those RGG. I'm, I'm a Yakuza speedrunner, please send me one of your bunch of plushies. Thank you very much. Um, but yeah, it's usually... Oh, I was I was just a bit too early with that. Um, yeah, so at this point we're going to be introduced to Majima's final fighting style and really the only one we're going to be using for the entire run. For Kiryu, there's exceptions we sometimes use these other styles for very specific things. Uh, not with Majima. This is Breaker. As uh, you can see, it's based on breakdancing. And man, is Breaker good. Man, is Breaker very, very good. Oh, I wanted to say about the UFO catcher. Usually it's pretty easy to not catch anything. And those who play the game casually may wonder why, why that's even a concern in a game. Because it's so easy to miss stuff. There is a specific UFO catcher prize. Those little brown lizards that are really, really easy to catch. Um, so it's it, I always just wait with bated breath to see if I get one of those. And if you don't, then it's pretty easy. But uh, if you get a brown lizard in there, you be a bit careful. This um, fighting style introduction is unique in that the revelation for it is separate from the actual tutorial. We're going to get the tutorial in a bit. Uh, what's the... Okay, that was interesting. Um, it, it's random where that group of NPCs will be, and they were just in a very, very bad place. So I wasn't sure where I would be able to... Um, how I would be able to go around them, but we found a way. Those four are literally the only NPCs you can't push your way through, and they spawn both here and outside of Serena later on, so they're in two really awkward places. Yeah, once I had them spawn in front of Serena and there was a fight spawn right in front of them, so that was fun. Um, but yeah, so Akko here is going to be harassed by these dudes, which is not cool, so we are going to take care of them. And this will be the Breaker tutorial. So there's not a lot really to tutorialize here, Breaker is just incredibly strong. Um, the game is going to want us to do a move called the Freeze, which isn't really important for us in the run. So I'm just going to head, go ahead and do that. And now hopefully we can get all these guys in one combo. You can usually do it, but... Uh, oh, beautiful. <laughs> Alright. Two, combo, two combos is fine too. As long as it's not three, you're good. And yeah, that's Breaker. As you saw, that Windmill combo is just incredibly, incredibly strong. Not only does it do a lot of damage and break enemies' guard, it uh, allows you to attack enemies in the floor, which is very unique to this fighting style. 
Um, and yeah, Breaker is not only very powerful in terms of its damage output, it's also very fast. So unlike Kiryu, who has kind of a balance of one style is very fast but very weak, and the other is very strong but very slow, uh, Breaker is just the base, the best of both worlds. All right, so we are done with Akko, and at this point, we're going to need to take a cab. And I'm going to be looking to both ends of the bridge to see what sort of fighting, what sort of fight spawns we have, because that's going to dictate which end of the bridge I'm going to run to. Um, I think the coast is clear. Yeah. Okay. Unless there's something around the corner. Oh, oh, no. Actually, there's those guys. But yeah, this is fine. If there was a nastier fight spawn on this side, I would just run to the other side, which is a bit slower. But um, it's it's not a huge deal. So yeah, uh, at this point, the weapon search or equipment search that we started earlier is over, and we are about to bear its fruit. So we're going to talk to Longwell here. Quickly mash through that screen. And now we're going to get some items. We get a rock. We get some iron. We get a rusty gear. We get a piece of wood. We get another piece of wood. We get handcuffs. And we get another rock. Four. Uh, but no, what's important about this weapon search isn't the items that we get. Uh, what's important is that this actually opens up the Dragon and Tiger branch in Kamurocho. Meaning that Kiryu, once we get back to his part, will also be able to buy weapons, which is going to be very, very nice. Um, and as we've seen, shotguns are very, very good, so we're going to go back in and get one of those. And that is our business with the Dragon and Tiger for now. We're going to be back later. And uh, yeah, now we continue with the rest of the story. Oh. Very important. Whip the dagger before we keep going. All right. So, does anyone want to explain what we're doing here uh, in this uh, massage clinic? Essentially, we're looking for Makoto Makamura. I've uh, been tasked with Sagawa. He's given us a, a way back in, a way out into the Tojo again. Uh, as long as we kill this Makoto Makamura, who we assume is that guy in the picture, because he's the guy that owns this massage parlor here called Higushi Kaikan. And we are here trying to find him, but unfortunately, we find his uh, blind uh, receptionist or the helper who's obviously giving a good massage to Majima right now. Uh, her blindness isn't something she was born with. We will get into that later on. He's a very, very important character. Yes. Also, a bit about the dialogue options or dialogue choices we get in the game. Um, if you hold D-pad up or D-pad down, you actually make the cursor for the choices appear like half a second faster. It's obviously not a huge time save, but you do a lot of these over the course of the game, so it's uh, actually it, it actually builds up nicely. By the way, uh, this is a good time to mention this is an unskippable cutscene, which we usually use for like a one minute break if you want to get, uh, I don't know, a drink or something like that, a very quick break like that. There's actually quite a few breaks in this run, so if Yakuza 0 is a run you're interested in, but you're intimidated about the fact that it's three and a half hours long, um, actually a bit over three and a half hours, uh, you really shouldn't be. There's a lot of really nicely placed breaks here. It's actually a really good game to use to get into somewhat longer speedruns. Anyway, Lee here is not too happy with us being in his clinic, causing all sorts of chaos. So we're going to have to deal with him. This is Majima's first boss fight, and it's going to be pretty typical of how we deal with most bosses with Majima. All right. Yeah. 
But what I'm going to do here is I, I'm going to do a windmill combo on Lee, and specifically I want to work him into a corner of the room where there's a bunch of furniture just to pile on the damage. So, oh, this is going very well. Nice. And as he gets up, dagger heat move. And this heat move, you can only activate it as Majime is pulling out the dagger, not when it's actually already out. So there's a bit of a delicate timing to it. So the nice thing about the damage output we got there is we now have Lee at 1 HP, and you can't finish him off until after this QTE. But what this means is that just with one um, stab like that, we can finish him off on his second phase. And that's really important because second phases for bosses in this game are super, super nasty. You want to see as little of them as possible. Right there, I finished Oishi off with the dagger. Again, shotguns are... Uh, hello? H hello? Shotguns are not very good for bosses and mini-bosses. And once I'm done with that, we get some extra money that we use to get the two damage upgrade for Breaker. Equip our shotgun and shoot, guys. It's actually amazing to me that <laughs> Breaker is already so much better than the other fighting cells. But the other fighting cells, they have their second damage upgrade unlocked uh, like much, much higher in the tree. And it's much more costly. It costs 100 million yen. Whereas you can get both of the upgrades for Breaker for, for, for just 4 million yen, which is uh, certainly an interesting balance decision. Okay, so these guys who showed up uh, are trying to, to um, kidnap Lee's assistant, who turns out to actually be Makoto Makimura. So already Sagawa was uh, a bit dishonest with us. And... This whole part introduces a stealth section. Um, so basically, what happens is we have to take Makimura, uh, we have to take Makoto um, across the city, and there will be um, enemies patrolling the streets, and we need to either fight them head on or try and hide away from them and sneak past them. Hence, why we call this a stealth section. So let's uh, let's see how this goes. I I hope I do well here. I hope I don't mess this up, because uh, you know, stealth isn't easy. Alright, let's see how we do. So the next... The first patrol is going to be right here, and what? Whoa. Oh, hey. Big Nando, where are your enemies? What the hell? What's happened? He's cheating. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, interesting uh, bit of speed deck here. Froob, do you want to explain this since you're the one who discovered this? Sure. Uh, this is about, like, four years old, but there's something really fascinating that happens in this stealth section and a stealth section that happens later in the run. If you remember at the very start of the stream, uh, Big Nono was actually already in a segment of the game playing it. That was actually the other stealth section. So what happens here is the game actually has a residual memory for up to eight fights in the stealth section. By doing those fights and making sure we don't quit out of the game to reset the memory, we can make the game remember, oh hey, we've done these fights, therefore it just doesn't spawn them in. There's a couple of fights that I led into were cutscenes like this one coming ahead that we can't despawn because they're cutscene fights, but every other fight that would normally be here no longer exists because of the thing that we did before the actual run began, which unfortunately we couldn't show you because it takes like nearly 10 minutes to actually set up because you have to load a save before the Wenli boss fight and then go through all of that. Um, but essentially, the way that this was found, for a long time, we thought this was a glitch uh, because I did a run where one time none of the enemies that I, like, I'd fought before had respawned and we thought it actually had something to do with Shakedown, which thank God it did not. Uh, in the few years before like we actually figured this out, no one had reset a run past this point. Because the run at the time was like five hours long. So, literally, it was only when, you know, I started not doing resets after this point that I realized, wait, I'm actually influencing this. And that's how we figured out quite quickly that the fights that we do beforehand and that there's an eight fight limit just stops all the fights. 
Great. And the uh, pathway that we take there, very importantly, uh, that pathway has no QTEs as well. So that is, whilst it's a longer pathway than the bottom path, it's quicker because there's no QTEs to interrupt you along the way. Hi. Yeah, and... Well, um, and I think the bottom pathway has one extra fight spawn, doesn't it? So that would make it not work with Chapter 8. Sorry? I think the bottom pathway has one more extra fight spawn as well, oh, uh, uh, so it wouldn't work be. with the Chapter 8 stuff. I, I actually only ever looked at the top one. Uh, Could be. Alright, so right here, by shooting the dudes, we get Oishi to either dodge or block. Either way, he's going to get staggered. And this will enable us to use a quick dagger heat move on him. And that's it. That's the end of Chapter 4 and the end of Majima for now. We're going to go back to Kiryu. Also, maybe something worth noting. Um... Since I'm kind of a newer runner, um, when I first learned this run, that last fight is uh, pretty hard, actually. Uh, since you have to um, kill that boss guy before he falls down to the ground. Otherwise, um, you don't finish the fight fast enough to get a money bonus, which uh, messes up the money quite badly. And um, yeah, we will have money problems later on then because of a shop that we have to do. Yeah, again, it goes back to how the money slash experience system works in this game, and it's really, really, really interesting, and it's really cool the way it rewards um, execution. I think it's very cool for the run. This dialogue between Nishiki and Kiryu uh, at this point is actually, ooh, that's a fight spawn, I'm gonna avoid that. We're gonna have to go the long way around. But it's faster than eating the fight. But it's really nice because Kiryu and Nishiki's voice actors just have a really nice chemistry between them. But g going back to the whole idea of stealth skip, uh, a lot of people when they hear about stealth skip for the first time, they'll say things about it, you know, not, not really being a new game run because you're not really starting from the uh, lean state of the game at startup. Uh, personally, like, I, I can understand why people would say that, but uh, honestly, it's just one of those things that's very easy and consistent to set up, and it just makes the run flow much better. So I, I personally don't see an issue with that, and um, the runners of this game so far have... No one has voiced any opposition to it. It's, uh, it's speed tech. Pretty cool. I mean, if Pokemon is allowed to use System Clock, I think this is also fine. Oh god, does it? I, I know about System Clock for some runs, I didn't know Pokemon does it. Uh, anyway, at this point we meet Oda for a work meeting here. And it's really important to pick the right options here, because if you, if you get any of the business etiquette here wrong, Oda just yells at you for uh, just long periods of time and you lose a lot of time. So this is one of those instances where picking the right option is actually optimal for a speedrun. And so you, you want get to take... an achievement. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, and you get an achievement. Oh, yeah. We, it's, it's interesting. We have, um, in the speedrunning community, we have quite a few achievement hunters. Um... But, uh, yeah, I, I just never know anything about the achievements. I, I usually play games in offline mode, so I don't even know when I get the achievements. Uh, this QT here, here is um, supposed to catch you off guard. It's pretty rare to get a QT during dialogue in a Yakuza game. Uh, if you fail this, it's a really, really big time loss. It's very, One very bad. minute and 30 seconds. I'm not really? kidding. Jesus. I timed it. <laughs> oh my god. In total, you can lose up to two minutes in there if you do the wrong options. That's how much time lost there is in there. So yeah, pick uh, pick the right options. But uh, yeah, this guy here is called Yamanoi. Yamanoi is going to be uh, pretty important for a side activity that we're just not going to touch at all during this run. Um, but those of you who've played the game casually probably have seen quite a few, uh, quite a bit of him. He's got a squatter problem. He um, needs us to get uh, a tenant out of 
out of his old office. Or I think it's a building he bought and was planning to set an office up in. Um, so yeah, we're going to go ahead and do that. And Oda, being a savvy businessman, tells us that even though this guy's a squatter, we still um, need to approach approach him with some sort of respect. So he wants us to get a confection gift box. So if we play the game casually, this is another one of those... <laughs> Times where you need to, again, go around the map looking for a specific item in the different shops. Luckily, since we have, uh, have anticipated this issue, we already have one in the inventory. So all I'm going to need from the game is to not give me any awkward fight spawns. That one's actually a really good one. Whenever you see that one, you can be calm that you're not going to um, have any, any uh, dangerous fight spawns chasing you. But, okay, yeah, at this point, we are going to go in and um, start negotiating, sort of. Oh. This is another one of those parts of the game where it really... It's got a lot of preamble, and the actual fight that comes up after it is uh, a bit underwhelming. And that's not even a shotgun thing. This is actually one of those fights that aren't really that much faster with shotguns, because if you don't have a shotgun, you just kind of go to the left and grab one of those bicycles and the fight ends pretty much as quickly. None. It's just a bit, a bit faster with the shotgun. Yeah, as Big Nono alluded to, this is all just a setup for what we like to call the first of the business sections in this run. So the fights that are a part of this just, they aren't very strong. Yes. So yeah, these guys are basically the guys who send the squatter here and they want a whole bunch of money to get him to go away. And uh, we don't want to pay, so there you go. Shotgun is nice for that fight because with the old bike strat, you can have one of them walk away and if that happens, more swings. No, oh, doesn't lose yeah. you too much time, but it can lose you like a second or two. Mm. Yeah, it's one of those... These games have a really deceptive amount of RNG to them because it's not just the RNG of fight spawns being at different locations on the map. It's also really a lot of being optimal in this game is having enemies group up um, in a way that makes it easier to damage multiple of them at the same time. And it really can make or break a run how well your groupings are. And there's things you can do to manipulate AI. We'll see some of them in a bit, not just in this run, but throughout the two days. But really, enemies can sometimes behave in very random and very annoying ways. And every every Yakuza speedrun has lost at least a couple of runs to some very weird behavior from enemies that they've never seen before up to that point. At any rate, uh, Oda is very pleased with our skills of uh, shooting people with a shotgun. So he invites us for a, for a night out in a re nearby bar called Serena, which name might be familiar to some of you. But before that, we have to go back and give Yamanoi uh, a mission report. And that's what we're going to do right now. Uh, that's not a fight spawn, is it? You can get really f nasty fight spawns here. So, uh, the, both of these guys are fight spawns. Oh, oh my god. Almost triggered that. <laughs> Oof. Y you really feel like you're at the nexus of the universe when two fight spawns are just right next to each other. But yeah, this. Fight spawns really hate you today. <laughs> yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, I'm, ju I'm just saying, no. fight spawns really hate you today. <laughs> yeah, it's it's been a, a rough few days with this game. <laughs> I've had some really rotten luck um, my past few runs, but that's, that's just the way things are. Anyway, this guy right here, he is, uh, as, uh, as the subtitles told us, the Leisure King. And basically, he's one of the five billionaires who are the villains of Kiryu's business side story minigame, real estate minigame. Um, and as you go through the real estate minigame, you'll eventually face off all five of them. They're actually really cool. They're some of the best bosses in the series, in my opinion. Specifically, the Media King is just such a good boss fight. But 
Uh, yeah, we don't get to see it in any percent. Even we we don't even see it in all sub stories. You only see it in uh, Hondo. At any rate, uh, Froob, this is another bit of speed tech that you found. So, do you want to talk a bit about this? Certainly. Uh We'll talk a bit more about this later on with the origins of how we found this, because we don't have that much time with this one. But right now, we have to wait five real-world minutes to have Yamanoi clean up the office. So whilst we can't do anything this time, Big no is just going to go play some OutRun. Uh, audio warning just in case the minigame does start, because it gets kind of loud, which is unfortunately nothing we can do, but Big Nono got there in time. Uh, so Big Nono is just going to leave, and then Big Nono is immediately going to receive a pager that says the office is actually already clean therefore skipping a five-minute real-world wait. You might be wondering why that just happened. Different minigames constitute a different period of time in this game. This skip in total over this run is going to save 20 minutes. And we'll explain why when we get to chapter 13. Yes. Um, and hey, and anytime I can not play OutRun, that's a, that's a good time for me. Uh, but yeah, this is the introduction to the actual mechanic uh, mechanics of real estate, which is a pretty simple management minigame. But it, it is pretty cool, and it really becomes very, very good as you advance it. Uh, if you max out real estate, then Kiri makes about a billion yen every five minutes, which is uh, pretty amazing. So at this point, we get a bit of money to buy our first property. And yes, I know what you're thinking, and no, you can't go into the abilities menu and, uh, menu and use that money to level up. Uh, the game actually locks your abilities menu during this section. So we're just gonna, gonna have to go and actually buy the thing. Now we're gonna pop back. And this, this ends the tutorial right here. And the inputs for this, for this um, minigame are very unique. Like, you never really use Y too much in the game otherwise, so whenever you come back to the game when you're de-rusting, that's one of the parts that's always very hard to be optimal with. Uh, very hard to remember the exact sequence of buttons you need to press. Oh, that's a... Okay. I almost did hit the trigger in time. Okay, we're good, we're good. Uh, we haven't commented on this before, but sadly, um, karaoke is... There are a lot of minigames that the game, the Yakuza games try to get you to engage in, and most of them you can skip. The one that you just very consistently can't skip is karaoke. Uh, so, sadly, we never get to hear Judgment either now or in the first chapter. But we, we actually get to hear a bit of the opening riff, of the opening uh, lead, I guess. Because uh, for some reason, in Chapter 1, you can exit karaoke the moment the title card shows up. But this time around, you can only exit once. So, get to hear a, a, a tiny bit of judgment. That's it. That's, that's all you're getting this run. Fortunately, the one consistently skippable minigame, karaoke. So it turns out the guys operating the squatter that we uh, evicted, I guess, uh, turns out they're tied to one of the Dojima lieutenants that we were already in hot water with, Awano. This guy right here in the front is Okabe, and I, I think he's Awano's captain or one of his lieutenants. I'm not really sure about that. But uh, yeah, he's, he's mad. He does not like that we messed up his business. And uh, Kiri is pretty mad because Awano and his guys came in and attacked Nishiki and terrorized uh, the bar. I say, oh, they also attacked Oda. Um, small, small detail. But yeah, we're going to have to deal with these guys. Now, as always, Okabe is a mini boss, so, or a boss, depends on how you want to uh, think about him. So we don't want to use a shotgun on him, so we're gonna dodge his attack, shoot his guys. Oh, knife was very close, nice. And this heat move should finish the fight. There you go. 
I had a I had a run earlier today where sometimes if these guys are too close to the walls, then the knife will appear behind you instead of in front of you, and it's very very awkward. But yeah, that heat move is very good. The important thing about the knife heat move is you want to be you want to make sure you're not too close to the wall when you're using the heat move, because there's a different. Uh, heat move you get with the knife then with the dagger and that one is a bit faster but it does way less damage so it's really important to position yourself correctly in that fight so after the fight with Akabe basically Awano tells us that we are in trouble and we have to give him uh, we have to basically give over Tachibana or he'll just keep hounding us and Nishiki Etc. Etc. So we are a bit lost at this point, and Kiru just decides to walk about town. And once you get to the parking, to uh, the empty lot, uh, Tachibana pops up and basically tells you to stand your ground, hold firm until he can find a way to deal with the Dojima family. So this is actually. I think this is one of the parts of the game where if you get here, uh, you feel a lot of relief because right after this dialogue, we're going to finally have a way of dealing with um, with fight spawns in a very simple way. So we'll see that in a moment. It's always really awkward to get out of here because the camera just flips over very quickly as you try to go through this narrow hallway and it's kind of hard to control but okay that was actually pretty decent alright this guy here his his name is Mr. Moneybags and he just uh, yeah literally throws money around and he's going to teach us the, the secrets of how to throw money around effectively in a way that will improve our lives greatly Just notice the subtitles call him yeah. Young Man. He, do he doesn't look that young. Um, but yeah, this is what's called Cash Confetti. Cash Confetti is really, really good because what it does basically is anytime you come across a regular fight spawn, as opposed to Mr. Shakedown, uh, you can use Cash Confetti to just immediately get it the road so you can run past it. As we'll s probably see during this run, it doesn't always work as smoothly as um, as the tutorial suggests but it will be very useful for us nonetheless as promised by doing the equi oh, by doing the equipment search tutorial with Majima we opened up the branch of the dragon and tiger right here in Kamurocho so we are going to do some weapon shopping here So I am going to buy uh, one dagger and ten shotguns. All we're gonna need. Oh, forgot to do something actually. Just for some extra ammo, you also want to equip to repair the shotgun you already have. And that's that. So it's a it's a really nice interplay here by getting a shotgun from Kiryu's. Sub story: We open up shotguns in the Dragon and Tiger for both Majima and Kiryu, and then by doing the search tutorial with Majima, we open up the Dragon and Tiger for Kiryu. So nice, uh, nice bit of cooperation there. At the end of the Cash Confetti tutorial, Mr. Moneybags told us that we should go to Theater Square and uh, check out check out uh, something interesting that's going to go down here. This is unfortunately an unskippable substory, so despite being uh, on the surface optional, the game will not progress until you finish this. This guy right here tells us that behind this door is uh, every man's dream, uh, a place where man's dreams come true. Unfortunately, when you go past it, you don't see Majima singing 24 Hour Cinderella, so it's, it's not entirely true, but yeah, um, he wants us we need to convince this guy to let us in. 
Uh, fortunately, we've just learned a way to show that we have money to spend. And having seen this, he's so, so impressed with our ability to throw money that he lets us into this place. Uh, this is the Jap Japan Catfight Club, JCC. It is not the worst minigame in the series, but top three. Uh, by the way, look at this guy walking very normally right there. Uh, would anyone like to describe the JCC minigame a bit and why it's so garbage? Bad? So, garbage is Basically, correct. imagine you're playing rock, paper, scissors. You have paper, your opponent has rock, but your opponent just punches you in the face anyways. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fun fact, even with a turbo controller, if the game says you lose, you lose. Yeah, yeah. it's uh that's it pretty much. <laughs> yeah, it's it's very random and um yeah, just just a bit of very um uh, it very poor taste fan service, I guess. Yeah, a lot of the older Yaxa games have that, and a lot of the newer games don't, which is nice. Uh, yeah. There's like a better quotation marks version of the JCC with uh, bugs in K1 that is a lot less you lose, and actually gives you a chance. Yeah, Mesu King, which, I mean, hopefully we won't see uh, in Bad Geese Run. Um, Mesu King is, at least has some kind of strategy to it. It's not that amazing, but there is at least something there. So right here we're about to go into this game's camera ocha set piece. Most Yakuza games have a set piece that happens during like in the streets of camera ocho themselves. And this is it for this game. Yeah, you have to go that very specific pathway there. What you can't see on the minimap is that you're actually blocked off from going any other direction. So you have to hope, you know, for nice fight spawns and no shakedown, who can walk around at that point. Oh. Yeah, the... If you try to go any other path, Kiri says, uh, oh, there's Dojima family guys down there, so I can't walk through. I guess internet died, question. Uh, but yeah, this is where we start using a lot of shotguns, and you really need to keep very... Ooh, that's unfortunate. You really need to keep very, very close watch on your ammo count. Because if you try to use the shotgun when it doesn't have any ammo, not only do you obviously not shoot, but also Kiri does this very slow attack with like the, the butt of the rifle. And it's very slow, it opens you up to attacks, we don't want it. Ooh, this is, uh, man, this is very unlucky. This is about the, the worst case scenario for ammo you can have at this point. I already need to switch a shotgun, which I haven't had to do that uh, this early in a while. But yeah, as you can see... Sorry, was someone... Was someone saying something? Uh, no, you're good. You do see it from Discord for a second, but you're back. Oh. So yeah, as you can see, we actually do use Rush, but only for mobility. Rush gives you the best movement speed. And uh, other than that, whenever we actually want to do damage, we switch back to Beast. And that's going to be pretty typical. That's going to be quite a few set pieces where we just switch to Rush when we need to move around and otherwise we're in Beast. Brawler, as you can see, is, is uh, nowhere to be seen. Just completely unused. Uh, th there will be one specific point where Brawler shows up. But uh, not for a while. Okay, four shots. This should be enough. So this is the one time we don't switch to rush because we only need two quick steps to get to the next fight trigger. Uh, and right here, we're going to see this big boy. Big boy is a mini boss. So we don't want to use the shotgun on him. So I'm just going to grab him, throw him back, uh, uh, not get any stomps off. That's very unfortunate. You, you do want a bit of extra damage. Oh no, okay. I'm just gonna have to do this. Oh boy. Oh, this is very, very bad. Yeah, this is, this is very, very unfortunate. Alright, get him up. Oof. 
yeah, this is not how things should go, but that's that's just what happens um, when you don't get the extra damage off on him. Uh, that's very unfortunate. Bad, bad fight right there. But okay, so uh, I usually... This is another unskippable cutscene. And I usually don't take this one for a break because it's pretty close to, to other breaks. And I, I actually really like this cutscene. It's one of the best boss introductions, I think, ever in any game. Um, but, you know, when you see an unskippable cutscene a lot of time, as a runner, you kind of have to find your own way of having fun with it. So uh, I'm going to uh, kind of destroy this cutscene, um, unfortunately, so apologies for that. But I do need to keep myself entertained. <laughs> In the speedrun life, there are no KOs. Tell you what, Kiryu. To me, a record or two don't mean a thing. Having some other runner beat me to GDQ couldn't care less. As long as I'm alive, getting back up for more. Which is why you, half butt like you, who doesn't even record his practice runs, is the one thing I can't stand! Now die, you little so and so! Ah, uh, all right. So this is Kuzei 2, um, a fight with a very, very cool intro that um, really, really doesn't uh, justify itself too much in the speedrun. So we're going to open up with full combo, a couple of stomps to get him back up, heat move to get him back down. Oh, I'm going to have a problem here because of the heat situation. All right, luckily this guy is uh, very easy to just keep hitting like so. There you go. Had to adjust a bit here. Yeah, I'm gonna have to do a, a couple of extra attacks. Unfortunate. Yeah, g getting... Um, man, when you get bad luck on the big boy fight earlier in the set piece, it's just very, very hard to recover from that. But okay, this is the end of chapter 6 and the end of another Kiri segment. So now we're actually going to go back to Majum. Should be noted, the strats in that fight there can be used on Legend as well. That, that like Most people think you need to use Rush in that fight because obviously uh, Kuze is in a slow like fighting style. No, use Beast. Yeah, it's actually... That's actually one of those fights where the old route is... Uh, the old route strat is still mostly used because the big differences to the route, um, to the new route of this run is using weapons, not just shotguns, but daggers as well. And that combo that I did, uh, that I used on Kuza at the start, you can just repeat that over and over again, and it works. It works on easy, it works on legend. And because on legend, um, if you use the same heat move more than once, heat moves to begin with don't do as much damage, but if you use the same heat move more than once, it barely does any damage. There's, um, what you call it? Um, there's there's a term for it that doesn't the heat quite damage come. retention. Yeah. Um, diminishing returns is what I was going to say, but yeah. Yeah. So yeah, on legend you need to do you use a lot more combos. Um, but yeah, right here I'm going to need the shotgun in a moment. And. Yeah, does anyone want to catch us up on the events of um, the end of Chapter 4 to this point in the game? So Majima went to finish his job and to kill Makoto, but what you obviously saw in those cutscenes is that Makoto is obviously very much alive. Majima obviously can't bring himself to 
you know, finish her off. He has no idea why Sagwa wants her dead, and we're not going to find out for a good long while. So, in the meantime, whilst we're hiding her in a, a warehouse owned by Odyssey, Odyssey's uh, owner or manager is actually helping us out here. Uh, we come to find Wen Lee, who, as you can see here, may have got shot. He's fine. He's playing Mahjong. He's living the life that I want to live. Love that guy. Love Mahjong. They're great. Uh, but this is the Mahjong cutscene that is completely unskippable. Uh, there's a re this is a good time to say that with unskippable cutscenes, yeah, uh, there's a really weird just kind a very of cool character. theme that and, most um, cutscenes that go into a fight are unskippable. There are exceptions to that, but this is obviously going to lead into a fight. So this is a very long cutscene that's unskippable. And because a lot of it is unique animations because of the Mahjong game, a lot of this is also unskippable. <laughs> Yeah, and this, uh, this is actually why we want to leave Chapter 4 with a bit of ammo in our shotgun. Because, um, well, as you'll see, this fight can, can be really nasty if you don't uh, deal with the enemies in it very quickly. Also, big shoutouts to uh, Lee's voice actor, Kazunari Tanaka, who sadly is no longer with us. Just did an amazing job in this game. Uh, Lee's one of those characters that he doesn't even... He's not even in the game that much, but he just has such an impact like you. I think he's one of the more memorable characters in this game. Yeah, he absolutely gives off, like, Fermenta vibes for Majima, for one thing. Like, a lot of people make the whole, you know, oh, his outfit later on is going to look like Saijima's. And, like, when Lee is supposed to be a Saijima-esque figure for Majima at this point, when Majima doesn't know what to do, he's still lost and confused. And when Lee, he knows what he's doing. He very much knows what he's doing. And he's got, literally, this cutscene is such a good, like, showing of... Wen Li having the exact knowledge of knowing exactly what Majima's feeling and what he's doing. Yeah, it's a really... The whole um, dialogue between them is just such a good character moment for both of them. But yeah, uh, here's... Here's uh, the fight we were talking about. As you can see, these guys have swords. Swords and knives, bladed weapons in general in these games are really, really nasty. Because you can block them, and if they hit you, they usually stun you. So, yeah, if you let these guys... If, if you give these guys the opportunity, they will mess you up very badly. So we need to deal with them uh, as fast as possible. Luckily, we have shot. But yeah, this is why you want three shots, because it's one, two, three. I did have a fight earlier today. Man, today's run was bad. Uh, I had a fight earlier today where they actually separated a bit, and I had to use four shots instead of three. Which it isn't a huge time loss, but it's one of those moments of the game really just messing with you. But yeah, having uh, done all that, we go back to Makoto to see what's up. Every time you go back into this alley, you get to hear that cat. Pretty cool cat. Uh, Makoto is hungry, so we need to go get some takoyaki. You may think, can't you just get, get takoyaki ahead of time and go right back in? Uh, but no, Makoto, Makoto wants her... Uh, oh no, this fight's one. I fear this fight's one. <laughs> oh baby, every... <laughs> Every time I get to that point in the run, uh, I, I dread having to see that fight spawn when I get out of the alley. So uh, there you go. Yeah, for those who don't know, you can't push your way through that fight because it will get into a fight. And you can't use the save point to despawn them because that save point and another save point in town uh, have sub-stories tied to them. So uh, you can't yeah, use having, that uh, very quickly to get rid of them, unfortunately. Um, that was weird. Yeah, so we use the opportunity here where we need to get the takoyaki anyway to get all the weapons we'll need for the rest of the run. So we get two more daggers and a whole bunch of shotguns. Um, I used to have my notes used to say 10 shotguns, 
but I would mistake that for 10 items in total, which is the number you see next to the money uh, in the shop menu. So I would just buy two shotguns less, two or three shotguns less than I would need, and that would just kill the run dead. So uh, I, uh, my notes just say have just one free space in your inventory at this point. Okay, so um, at this point we're going to have the actual first major break of the run. So uh, at the beginning of the chapter, Odyssey's manager told uh, Majima that there's a new thing, there's a new craze called cabaret clubs that he should check out. So we uh, use this point in the story to check one of them out. And Majima unwittingly becomes the manager for this place. And to tutorialize us on how to uh, play the hostess minigame, we're just going to get an unskippable round of it right here. Oh, that's the wrong option. Unfortunately, you can't skip this part, and you also um, can't interact with it in any way, as you would lose a lot of time, so uh, we, we just have to sit through it, which is actually good, because it gives you a nice three-minute break uh, right in the middle of the run. Now, I know that the uh, hotfix meta for when you have a break like this is to read some manga. There you go. Yeah. I do have this uh, Great Outdoor Fight Aquid book by Chris Onsted. So I'm just going to read a bit of this as uh, maybe people will want to explain a bit of the mechanics of the Hostess Club minigame. Um, so the basic uh, principle of this um, minigame is basically that you get customers. Um, and obviously we don't want to interact with Do we with have a problem? Oh, um, yeah, you oh, sometimes uh, see Can anyone still hear me? We can hear uh, you. We yes. can hear you, but screen Hello? stopped. Oh. Nope. Big Nano can't hear us. Is the stream still live? Kind of. There's a lot of lag. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I can't well, hear anyone on comms. Have internet lag. Alright, folks. Slight internet technical issues. We've got it sorted. A nice three-minute segment for it. Thing from Discord. Mm. Uh, for, to fill on the silence a little bit, yeah. To deal with this? Um, I definitely wasn't starting to explain this whilst muted. Um, but as Firelight was saying, uh, the mechanics of this basically you Hello? get customers come in, they sit down, you but you give them one Hello? of the, the uh, cabaret hostesses that you have to basically sit down and obviously do the stance for them. And Sorry, I'm just going to have to restart way, you Discord. Can level them up. Uh, to fully complete this in this game is a minimum of 36 times. There's a lot of upgrades in K2's cabaret segment, which means you can do it like a minimum of just like 12 or 13 times. It's a lot faster in K2. Hello? Hello, can you yes. hear us? Okay, yes. Uh, have we gone to the break? Hello? No, we're still live. We're still live. Okay, so this is a good time for a break. <laughs> okay, well. <laughs> well, we're gonna we're gonna take a quick break, everybody, just so we can Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Games on Quick Hot Fix. Sorry about that quick little technical difficulties there, but everything should be all sorted out, and we are ready to go whenever. So if you want to just give us a quick countdown, we're all set to go. Yeah, so let's go in three, two, one, go. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, bit, of, bit of an issue with my Discord connection. At any rate, uh, so having gone through the Hostess Club minigame introduction... We can now go back to the Grand. 
And I, I think, uh, I, I don't know if anyone actually got, oh, by the way, right here, for Kiri Cash Confetti is an uh, required part of the story, but you can actually skip Cash Confetti with Majima. Uh, it takes about 20 seconds to not learn Cash Confetti with Majima, so you would be gaining that time. The problem is it's extremely, extremely unlikely that you'll get through the rest of the run without ever needing to do away with... Um, without ever needing to do away with a fight spawn. So I, I really see no scenario in which it would be really optimal to skip Cash Confetti, but hey, if people want to go for it, I, uh, I do, I do uh, admire a bit of guts in my speedrunning. Anyway, right here, uh, here's one of my favorite contributions to the run. This is called, oh, that wasn't even good. <laughs> This is called Waiter Boost. You can only walk very slowly in the Grand, but if the Waiter walks into you, he gives you a bit of a boost. However, in this specific case, he actually boosted me past the stairs I had to go down, so it wasn't it wasn't even good. It wasn't even good this time, Waiter Boost. But yeah, I, I don't know if... Did we actually get to talk a bit about uh, the mechanics of the Hostess Club minigame, or...? Yeah, Poop explained it. Okay, cool. Uh, but yes, so I have two shots left in my shotgun. That's going to be okay. Um, a constant thing you have to keep in mind during this run is how much ammo you have, not just in the shotgun you have at any given moment, but also if you have any partially used shotguns, you want to portion those out in pretty specific ways. I'll call it a few, sorry, a few examples of this over the course of the run. Yeah, anyway, uh, so coming out of here, we're going to meet uh, a familiar face, familiar and not very friendly face. So this guy right here is Oishi that we've already fought twice in Chapter 4, once in uh, the Masada once in the massage clinic and uh, another time at uh, in in the river fight and he's back he is not too happy with us um i, I guess i haven't got to talk about gun enemies in this game much like um sword enemies gun enemies are one of the more dangerous types um when they shoot you 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 fall down you get stunned it does a good amount of damage even on easy uh, it's just not a good time. If I could give you a tip for Yakuza games, it's just don't get shot. It's not a good time. It's not fun. But yeah, after dealing with his goons, much like the river fight, one last dagger heat move on Oishi and is done. So... Yeah. Oishi's people are the ones that we fought in Chapter 4 that we got Makoto away from. Um, for some reason, these guys... For some reason, we don't know yet. These guys also want Makoto. And kind of an awkward moment here where Tagawa uh, sees us having a chat with these guys and wondering what the hell's taking so long with Makoto. And Majima says one of his more badass lines, which is... Um, I, I would sooner come to a phone poll with my problems than you. Or, I'm paraphrasing, but uh, yeah, this is the actual line. And yeah, at this point, we need to meet up with Lee again to see um, how to get Makoto away from Sagawa and this new group that try that's trying to get their hands on her. On the way, we're going to cross this bridge, which is really, really scary because uh, it's... Not only are there sometimes very nasty fight spawns on that bridge, but also, for some reason, Cash Confetti is kind of kind of janky in that part. Like, many times when you'll uh, try to use Cash Confetti on the bridge, it just won't work at all. And because it's something weird with there being a loading zone in the middle of it, sometimes you'll have fight spawns coming in from both sides. It's a whole mess. But that is actually a pretty easy crossing right there. Okay. 
not part of the bridge is also the bit we alluded to earlier where the save point is actually a sub story for the guy with the bag phone. Oh, that's oh, a good yeah. bag phone guy. Oh my god. Okay, long way around. Don't catch me, don't catch me, don't catch me, don't catch me, don't catch me. Uh, we, we've not talked about uh, glitched state of awareness yet, have we? No, we haven't. Uh, so, uh, would you like to go ahead, Froob? Sure. So, when you've noticed uh, throughout the whole run so far, when the normal set of three enemies that walk around like those enemies first notice you, if you look on the minimap, you'll see that they have a yellow cone to be all like, oh, they've alerted to you. And then when they're trying to chase you to initiate the fight spawn, they go into their red state. With. Going into certain like text boxes, like the one that Big No No just walked into, if it doesn't despawn the enemies and leaves them on the map, they're actually in a glitch state where instead of going back into their yellow alert, when they next come out of that little cooldown period between being able to like chase you and not chase you, they will be in that state of alert immediately and they can instantly get into a fight with you. Yeah, it's uh it's great fun. But it is. So at this point, Lee has a plan. He's found a woman who uh, looks a lot like Makoto, uh, and according to him, is not a very nice person. So uh, he wants us to basically kill her and make it look like she was Makoto, and that way everyone's off the trail. Uh, Majima wisely decides that this is a very, very poor plan and doesn't want to play along with it. And Lee gets kind of mad about that, so we are going to be once again fighting Massive Man right here. And this fight is a, a bit more subtle than the first fight with Lee, because in the first fight you couldn't really finish off Lee until after his QTE. But in this fight, the QTE actually does damage and he can, it can actually finish Lee off. Um, if his health is low enough. So we really want to be able to get as much damage on him as possible during the first phase so that the QTE just ends the fight immediately. Otherwise, we're going to lose a lot of time. So that is uh, what I'm going to try and accomplish here. Um, it's, it's partly up to good positioning, but it's also a bit of luck that decides what you're going to get here. Alright, so as usual, I'm going to open this fight with a breaker windmill combo and combo this man against the wall. Knock him up against the wall like that. You don't need a full combo, partial combo like that is fine. Dagger heat move. And now's the big part. Now you really, really uh, don't want to let Lee initiate his QTE. Okay, nice, that's good. And second heat move, beautiful. That should do it. Bit of a stomp here, just for the extra damage. Probably don't need it, but I like to do it just to be on the safe side. And this is, uh, of course, again the same GT as we did, as we had in Chapter Four, uh, but there is another um, second part to it. And yeah, this should finish. Nice. That is a perfect lead. Very, very cool. Uh, okay, so that plan having fallen through, the only thing we can really do is uh, go go to work. Go back to the Grand. This is a pretty scary part because if uh, there's a really bad fight spawn, or specifically if Mr. Shakedown is on the bridge, there's really not much you can do. Normally you could just go to the taxi and uh, take that instead, but uh, as you can see, the path to the taxi is blocked off. So all we can do is just walk up here. And once we get into Majima's office, uh, office sorry, we um, get a message from Lee telling us to meet him back in Hobushikaiken, back in his massage clinic. So this is 
This was actually a lot more common in these games in the early days, where they would just have you go from one side of the map to the other and then back. Uh, this is kind of a way for the game to encourage exploration, I guess, but uh, yeah, it's just it, it's just kind of a time waster in here. It's also kind of frustrating when you're starting out the game because you beat Lee 2 and you think, oh, it's the boss of the chapter, so now I'm going to save a lot of time. Uh, but no, you still have about a minute that you have to you just go back here and uh, then back to the clinic. So yeah, the actual end of the chapter will come right here. Gotta make sure that there's no fight spawns on the way. Okay, cool. And uh, yeah, would anyone like to talk a bit about what happens... Um, at the end of this chapter, the beginning of the next chapter. I'll be honest, this is the moment what, uh, I've actually forgotten in the story. <laughs> Fair enough. So, uh, and Oh, it's the phone call, isn't it? Uh, the... Yeah, yes, yeah. Nish Tani, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so basically, we go back to the Higushi Kaikan to go meet up with Lee. Tell him everything that's going down, and we get a phone call there for Majima, not for Wen Lee. And it is somebody who has holed himself up in the ground who goes by the name of Nishtani. Nishtani is a very, very interesting person, as you'll see uh, coming up in a second here, and is actually going to start off a boss fight immediately. Yeah, sometimes the game just doesn't want to. Mount, to go over to the yes option. It, it really wants you to watch the cutscene. Alright, so Nishitani has a good damage QTE. We don't need to do as much damage to him in his first phase. Uh, we will do one dagger heat move. But yeah, at this point we can just stomp him a bit and then do the circle move for Majima. Majima doesn't have a grab with uh, circle B whatever, whatever button you use. Um, but he does have, in specifically in Breaker, I should say, in his other styles, he, he does. Or actually just in Thug. Anyway, uh, not in this style. What he does have is that aerial kick, and that kick actually uh, has a similar effect to Kiryu's shoulder, um, shoulder check in Beast Mode, which is going to be a bit more important in Kiwami. But basically moves that break enemy guard can be very useful in forcing them to go into their second phase. Uh, otherwise, enemies in these games can be very rebellious and just kind of walk around for a bit before they, they realize they should go to their second phase. So it's good for a bit of consistency. This cutscene right here is completely unskippable. You can't skip the whole thing. You can't skip the text even. So you just get to enjoy a bit of Nishitani. Uh, voiced by Keji Fujiwara, Fujiwara, who unfortunately also passed away a few years back. But for the fact that he doesn't really have that much of a role in, the, in this game, like, we've seen most of his role already, and there's not much more other than this. Um, he, he certainly has a big impact. I think, wasn't there a poll where he came second or in some top position for one of the most beloved characters in the series or something like that? In the top 10, uh, above long-term series characters like, you know, Araka, Daigo, shout-outs to Yuki, the hostess, beating Daigo in that poll as well. All right. Yeah, Daigo doesn't have much of a role in this game, but you, you really you really learn to dislike Daigo as time goes on. Alright, at this point, it's very important that I remember to equip a shotgun. Need one with 10 shots, uh, because unless we get really... Well, if we get decent luck, it will save us a menu in the next chapter. I know. Very important not to talk to that lady, that's a pretty big time loss. One thing that's good to know about these games is in the, the upper right corner, you get the icon for the interaction that you're um, gonna get. And you can always see when it switches from talk to enter, 
that's when you start meshing. Or really, after the talk uh, prompt disappears, that's when you can start meshing, because the next one will be the one for the door. <laughs> All right, so uh, it turns out Nishitani went through with Lee's plan because, because Majima's idea of getting rid of uh, the evidence that they ever had that plan in the first place was to just throw it all in the trash. And Nishitani just happened to walk by and picked it up. Uh, and he said, oh, this looks like a good plan. I'll just do it myself. So yeah, he faked Makoto's death, and Sagawa here is uh, basically grilling us about this because there's a lot of odd details about it. Majima, Majima basically tells him, uh, no, no, trust me, I totally killed that woman. And Sagawa says, yes, I, I truly, truly believe you, don't worry about it. Uh, so yeah, everything's above board, so I guess we just got away with it. Nothing to worry about. So yeah, at this point, as we leave the Grand, a uh, stereotype doctor is going to tell us that uh, he has some medicine for Lee and we should really hurry up and get it to him. That's what we're going to do next. Very credulous, Majima is about this whole thing. And this is actually the last time we see a whole bunch of important locations for Majima's story. It's our last time in the Grand, our last time coming to this um, to this warehouse. So the guys we fight here, in an earlier cutscene that we obviously skipped, we see that these are the guys who are keeping track of Majima for Sagawa. So this is sort of um, where a, a bunch of uh, plot threads resolve. Also, check out this fight. This always makes me laugh. You fight these... Three guys here who, who do look like they're in the Yakuza, they do look like they might be gang members. Uh, and then there's the guy on the right, which we can't quite see yet. Yeah, you'll see him right here. This guy in the brown coat, who just looks like someone's accountant who tanked along. Uh, no idea why they decided to use that character model for this, but um, there, there you go. Uh, yeah, this is the second stealth section. This is actually what we saw in the beginning of the run when I pretended to just be playing Yakuza 0, haha. <laughs> was actually the final part of setting up stealth skip. There's usually a fight right here. Uh, but uh, we got rid of it. So there you go. And Froob was mentioning how optimizing the uh, path for stealth skip isn't just about the fights themselves, but also about QTEs. The path we take in this uh, self section actually does have a QTE coming up, but it's still fastest because it's it just um, the fastest way to go. Also, there's a limit on how many fights you can actually despawn using stealth skip. It's up to eight, I think. But that's yeah, also right. something you need to get into to take into account. But if you fail this QTE, you get an extra fight. And the second QTE is a, a bit fast on easy. On Legend, it's actually a pretty scary QTE. It's uh, very possible to fail that Q on Legend. Yeah, was this the last Yakuza game where QTEs get harder and faster on higher difficulties, with the exception of Lost Judgment, of course? Oh, yeah. I think it was, right? <laughs> Lots of it. Yeah, because there's none in the Dragon Engine. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm very glad they stopped with it. Uh, we, we're, man. Um, hold on. Okay, very good. So we we actually were optimal with ammo this chapter, which is really really important because again you want to finish this chapter with at least three shots. Uh, we'll see why in chapter eleven when we next see Majima. But yeah, the 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 funniest example of that is actually Dead Souls, which we're gonna see Dead Souls any percent tomorrow. 
Um, really cool run, really recommend catching that one. But on Dead Souls difficulty, which is the highest difficulty in that game, the QTEs are just silly. Yeah, yeah, they are. We'll explain that during Dead Souls. <laughs> it's actually... it's re Some of them literally only last a few frames. You actually have to cheat with the X and B to, uh, don't to actually do that. Hmm? You don't have the time displayed because of the lag in the game costing you time for the QTE. It's wild. Yeah, that was a sure something. <laughs> I'm very, very proud and happy that Panda's going to be showing that off tomorrow. <laughs> mm -hmm. Alright, so at this point, Kiryu is still on the run from the... Do oh, you can skip this. Uh, this this is one of those things, by the way, that if you're a new runner, and this is for all Yakuza games pretty much, um, it can be really, really difficult to remember which cutscenes are skippable and which aren't. Because there's really not not much in the way of a rule of thumb. Uh, in the older games, you would be able to skip any cutscene, um, any pre-rendered cutscene. And we're talking like the first two games, the PS2 games. And then for the rest of them, you would mash through text. And ever since Yakuza 3, it's, at least Yakuza 3, I don't know about Kenzon. But yeah, it, ever since the PS3 era, essentially, it's always been up in the air which ones you can skip. So it, it just really takes a long time to get used to. And even coming back to a run and de-rusting, there's always a few that you miss, I find. Uh, yeah, I've been uh, running Zero for like eight months now, and every time I try to de-rust, it's, it's a pain to figure out which cutscenes are skippable and which aren't. Yeah. yeah, as said earlier, the rule is if it leads into a fight, <laughs> spoilers, this one's leading into a fight, then it's usually not skippable. But as you saw before Nishtani's boss fight, all of those cutscenes were skippable, so it's not just as easy as saying, "Oh, well, there's not a f there's not a fight coming up." Then you know it's skippable because that's also not true either, which sucks. Yeah. It's nice with the Dragon Engine stuff. When you see the Dragon Engine games, you'll see that pretty much ninety five percent of cutscenes are skippable, which makes the Dragon Engine games nice for just a casual replay, just because you know you don't have to sit through cutscenes like this. Yeah, any, any rule you try to formulate about which cutscenes are skippable ends up being that just the skippable cutscenes are the skippable cutscenes. Uh, there's not much more to it than that. But yeah, it's, it's something about the Dragon Engine where... Uh, I guess any cutscene that moves characters around on the screen is a problem to skip because... Um, you know, the, the game can only move them if it actually moves them around. And in the Dragon Engine, I guess they found a way of doing it in the background, so a lot more stuff is skippable. Anyway... Um, <laughs> we, we tried hiding in Serena, but these guys are on to our brilliant um, tactic of going in through the back door. So we're just gonna have to deal with them. Um, a lot of people I see here roll to the right. You actually want to roll to the left. This is this is the left roll meta uh, that we're living in right now. Yeah, that was obviously just the beginning. There's a, a bit more guys to deal with back here. And the way this fight is going to work... Um, I said that there's not much in terms of AI manipulation that we have for these games, but one thing that seems very, very consistent across Yakuza games from the very early ones to the very recent Dragon Engine ones is if you turn your back to enemies and walk away from them, especially if it's towards the corner, it really seems to set them on your path. So what I'm going to do is to actually walk extra here. One, two, three all the way to the end and uh, yeah it really ooh, it really sets up enemies very nicely I have two shots this mm, I hope this won't be a problem usually you only need one shot for the next fight but uh, I've been I've been hurt by this game before 
So uh, after having deal having dealt with all these guys, we have the actual Dojima lieutenants uh, back up front, and they are they are not too happy with us. So in in this phase of the story, um, who's a back in chapter one failed to get us under control, and now Awano is the one in the lead. And you might think, okay, then maybe at this point you fight Awano. Uh, that's um, that's not going to happen just yet. Uh, put it one way. So, yeah, we're going to face off Kuze once again for the third time. And a, a nice little um, quirk of the tech skip here is that it only skips some of Kuze's animation at the end of this. So as he's yelling at us, his mouth is just going to hang wide open here. It just looks like he's going... Wow. But yeah, you immediately want to get away from this guy. He's very aggressive, so I'm going to do a step back and shoot and hopefully get everyone in one shot. Very nice. Grab a dagger and a heat. Nice fight. All right. Nice after fight. Sorry. I just said nice fight. <laughs> oh. Thank you. Uh, but yeah. Two stomps for extra damage, then the QTE, another stomp, dodge, stall a bit until we can use the heat move again. <laughs> Ow. Plain, wow. Plain. Uh, that, that can might, really might have easily... Might take that nice fight back for a second there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that, can, that can knock you down really easily. That was a... Uh, nice physics. I do, I do love when physics happen. But all right, that uh, ends that fight. Tachibana came in to the rescue. It's actually a really badass cutscene. Uh, kind of a shame that we can't show that because uh, Tachibana just comes in and, and plows through a bunch of those guys and gets us out. Be very careful about your movement here because if you accidentally go up, uh, that causes Oda to talk to the guy next to the save point and you have to go back and get him and it loses you like 30 seconds. It's very, very nasty. But yeah, Tachibana and Oda try to talk to the leader of Little Asia uh, to convince him to let us stay. But uh, he, he is not too pleased about the idea of uh, further aggravating the Dojima family. So uh, instead, Tachibana suggests that we stay in the park here. And coming up is actually a completely unskippable cutscene, and this will be our... Uh, second break, so we can just go to an ad break right here, if that's fine.
あれそっちのやつなんかホームレスっぽくないじゃん別にいいんじゃねここにいいんだから同罪だよ同罪<笑>逃げんなよややめろ何命令してんのやめてくださいだろなんだこいつああああああやってくれたよこれ大怪我だよな一車両一車両どうしようもねガキどもだなそうです僕らガキの未成年です人殺しても罪になりません罪にならなきゃ罰は受けねえとでも思ってんのか世の中そんなに甘かんねえぞ生きがいいね<笑>俺らとやる気かよおいこいつ俺のこと殴ったんだぞびっくりぜダメそろそろ本気でやっちゃう一変人が死ぬとこ I do like the new fight strat for this with guns rather than the old route the old route for this fight is just awful Not being able to build up enough heat to be able to take care of any of them. So it was just、uh, beast combos, I assume? Yeah, you beast combo the first guy, get the baseball bat for the last one, and as you can probably guess, it's just slow. Like, you don't have、yeah. any heat at the start, so you don't do any damage with Golden Fist. The baseball bat is good when you can get it, but at that point, you've already done a full beast combo. So, yeah, that strat is so much nicer. Like, so, so much nicer. Yeah, I can see that. I don't. I don't are we still alive? Yeah. Okay, yes, we are. <laughs> We're all good. <laughs> Very nice. Okay. That was、uh, a nice so, break. So I、had. was just quiet for a while for no reason. <laughs> Um, <laughs> we, we were all just chilling for a while. We were just yeah, enjoying the atmosphere. It's not easy just. You, 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 don't, you don't want to just hear my voice all the time. Jesus. Who can stand that for too long? Um. Anyway,、uh, yeah, that, that's a big unskippable cutscene.、Uh, which, as someone said in chat, yeah, it's,、uh, it's, it, I think it really shows how important it was for the developers to show、uh, that, you know, even in this time of wealth and everyone on the surface has money and such,、uh, there's still people who are, you know, left,、uh, who are still having a difficult time. And they're not treated too well by society during these times. Anyway. So, right here, we get a bit of a callback to, again, the first Yakuza with a set piece in the、uh, Tojo Clan HQ. That's very unfortunate. That's not what you want to see.、Uh, the Light Heavy here will usually get all three of these guys with one hit.、Uh, however,. Um, it's a marathon run, so everything just has to not go that well.、Um, but yeah, this is another one of those instances where we will switch between using Beast for the actual damage and Rush from mobility. You want to get rid of the gun with the gun right there as fast as, you, as, fast as possible. So he doesn't、uh, cause us any trouble. And I also need a full shotgun. You can start shooting once that guy starts running. Nice, two shots. Coming up here, we have a guy who brings a, a sword to a gunfight, which、uh, actually works quite well for him because, again, he's a mini boss, so we can't do much to him with the shotgun.、Um, so we're just going to have to, first of all, do this QTE. Actually, not, not a whole lot of mash QTEs in this game. Most of them are just a single button press, but there's a few of them. I'm going to throw this sword at this guy. He will either dodge or block, which will usually just open him up to a grab, which will immediately finish him off. Bit of a break for dialogue here with Tachibana and Oda.
And once we walk down here, another group of enemies shows up. Once the guy in the front starts moving, switch styles and shoot. And now there's going to be a whole bunch of dudes here out in the open. Uh, I want to shoot them kind of carefully. I want to max out the amount of enemies I finish off before the next phase. Because Sword Guy is actually coming back. Hold up situation, by the way, for your fighting style. <laughs> yeah, he's using the style of Oketa. Hmm. That was actually really good. So yeah, Light Heavy with Lantern makes short work of Sword Guy in his second form. And uh, then it's more shotguns. And it's actually really nice that I finished that set piece with two shots because that's going to be just enough for the next fight we have with Kiryu. But yeah, if you've been keeping track, this is uh, the end of chapter... This is another... Another one of those chapters where uh, instead of just ending right after the last fight, the game gives you another minute of walking around. In this case, it's pretty understandable, though, because the next chapter will actually see us in Sotenbori. So the game just wants us to have a, have a chance to finish up any business we have in Camarocho before... Oh, no, I don't want to purchase this property. I was afraid of this. <laughs> it's really... Well, one of the uh, things you have to contend with in the Western versions of these games is that the confirm button is the same as the dash button. So you got to always be cognizant to not try to dash when you're next to anything interactable. Because um, that can do it can cost you anything from a couple of seconds to just completely killing your run if you interact with something very unfortunate. The Japanese versions of these games, which are optimal for uh, the PS2 games, have a different problem where the, um, the confirm button is the same as your grab button. But that's a whole different kettle of fish. So yeah, at this um, point... You also just... Sorry, go ahead. Can I? Uh, you also just saw uh, Nono running through Little Asia, and um, as a newer runner, this place is pure hell because um, it's a very small corridor and you very often get stuck on these little corners. So you might lose lots of time if you run through there. But yeah, does anyone want to give a bit of a recap of uh, what's, what's happened with Majima since we last left him off? It was the end of the self section, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, so basically, we took Makoto over to see Wenli, uh, and unfortunately, uh, when we got to Wenli's, we obviously had that fight with the three guys. After the fight with the three guys, Wenli went to get a van ready for us to leave Sotenbori, and unfortunately, the van went bang, uh, and Sagawa appeared um, and took, well, tried to take Makoto away, uh, but was shot in the back by some other person who, we don't know who they are. They don't have an association with the Kijin clan here, but Nishitani does. So to find out more, we're going to go and try and find Nishitani by going to his office and shooting his subordinates? Question mark? Either way, Coliseum section. Yeah, it's a really... Th that cutscene after the fight is... Um, is really good because Majima gets the one of the Kijin clan guys to tell us more about Nishitani. And Majima basically tells them something to the effect of uh, that's that's why Nishitani doesn't tell you anything because the moment anyone smacks you around a bit, you immediately tell him everything they want to know. Majima g gets uh, increasingly sassy throughout this run, and it's very nice to see. But yeah, this is uh, the Coliseum. Coliseum is uh, <laughs> Coliseum is an interesting part of this run. Basically, this guy here is a crooked cop. And he says he can get us, uh, he, he can um, take us to meet Nishitani if we fight three guys for the entertainment of the uh, PS1 era audience. Um, the, the reason why the audience is so low res is just because I'm on low graphical settings. I haven't mentioned this before. This game does have a load. Oh, I'm actually doing this wrong. This game does have a load remover. 
but it's still, you know, just to have shorter RTA times, it's still good to um, to get your um, graphical settings a bit lower. It also doesn't really, like the game looks-wise doesn't take that big of a hit. The game still really looks good on low graphical settings. It's just a bunch of details like, you know, the, there's less anti-aliasing and stuff like that. But uh, it's not a huge sacrifice. Uh, can you pull out the thing? Unlike the Dragon Engine, the everything looks not so good <laughs> on low settings. Yeah, if you put everything on the Dragon Engine to low settings, you can actually make the games look like they did back on the PS2, which is great. It's I when I I only currently run one Dragon Engine game, Kiwami 2, and I put that one on medium graphical settings. I, I just can't bring myself to put it down on low. Low is just too much. Um, but yeah, uh, would anyone like to say a few words about Dead Puncher here? So Dead Puncher, he likes to punch your runs dead. He's very aptly named. Even though he doesn't have a weapon, unlike the previous two opponents, uh, he's probably more dangerous than both of them. Dead Puncher has a whole bunch of hyper armor just from the start, and then he also has a post-heat mode like the previous boss, uh, Dodge Kirihito, where he'll get even more dangerous and he will be able to knock you out of most of your combos. So a lot of the Colosseum is obviously doing, hopefully, Combos at the right time so that we can just build up our heat so that we don't run out of heat too much. And then just make sure we can manage all of that whilst Dead Puncher hopefully doesn't go to phase two. And as you can saw there, when he flashed very briefly, that was his hyper armor. That's a little bit hyper armor. That's the EX mode. Unfortunately, with little heat, we can't immediately do a heat move. You can, even with enemies like this that are resistant to guns, if you shoot them a couple of times like that, they will still stagger and go down, which obviously either opens them up for a couple of hits like this, which as you can see has a lot of damage, or when they get back up, a heat move. But unfortunately, Dead Puncher is not playing well nice today. I mean, uh, to be honest, at least he's not as bad as it was in my run earlier today. He, he uh, Chapter 11 cost me 35 seconds today in an earlier run uh that was fun he, he like he started punching from the very beginning but yeah that puncher he, he's a bad guy um you can try and i do try these days to beat him without using a shotgun but if he gets away from you too much uh yeah the shotgun makes it very easy to end the fight which otherwise is kind of terrible um there's gonna be one more instance of fight in this game where despite fighting bosses that don't take a lot of damage from shotguns, uh, we're still going to shoot them just to stagger them a bit. That's going to be a bit later in the run. But yeah, uh, this is Nishitani too. Apparently Nishitani is very comfortable in jail because um, thinks no one can get to him here. We'll see how that pans out. Uh, but yeah, we are now going to fight Nishitani again. And this fight is Mostly going to play out like the one in the Grand, but there's a bit uh, a bit more nuance to this one. So first of all, you want to approach Nishitani where you start your combo. Otherwise, he will basically always try to do that. I did the wrong combo. I can't believe that. I swear I've been running this game for a while. <laughs> okay, that's better. There's your Windmill combo. And Dagger Heat move. And I'm going to try and get a bit, a bit more damage on him. Uh, this should be enough. All right, so we get the same QTE that we got in the first Nishitani fight. So this is going to bring his health down quite a bit. Mm -hmm. By the way, you'll see... Well, I'll talk about this in a moment. Oh, okay, yeah, this is plenty. I could have actually done a bit less damage, but that's fine. And this QTE, which uh, is new to this fight. Didn't have it on the last one. This will actually finish the fight. All right, that's a decent, decent Nishitani too, other than the little mistake I made at the beginning of the fight.
All right. So uh, before we get to the set piece, does anyone want to recap uh, the events of after the Nishitani fight? <laughs> Well, unfortunately, Nishitani is no longer with us. Uh, when we said that he doesn't like stay around in this game too much earlier, uh, he, literally it's about 20 minutes. You see, as Big Nono said earlier, you see kind of like the initial cutscenes from the previous chapters, and then just this chapter. And then unfortunately, Nishitani is no longer. But Nishitani really instills, instills in Majima a kind of sense of, if you want to do something, go and do it. Like. The Majima that most people know from the later game, that's what he kind of learns a lot from Nishitani. So both Wen Li and Nishitani as kind of like two mentor figures in a sense in this game are now gone and we're left with Sagawa with a gun. So we're here at the Camellia Grove because supposedly this is where Makoto is. Yeah, and um, Majima just continuing to um, get, he, he's very much done at this point, and he gets more and more done uh, as the game goes on. Um, and yeah, the, the, these guys are the Nikyo Consortium, they're a secret organization within the Tojo clan, and they try to get him to just, uh, you know, go, go away on his own. Um, and he calls them, it's it's a really badass uh, line, something like a troop of weasels that won't even fly the clan flag. Uh, and they don't take too nicely to that, so we're gonna fight a bunch of these guys. So this is another set piece where it's really, really important to keep track of your shotgun ammo. I always um, equip a full one before we start this. And once these guys are done talking, we can begin with the shooting. Alright, so, to begin with, these guys are very tightly grouped together, which is nice, because we can just finish them off with a couple of rounds. Right here, I want to get to the corner of this room as fast as possible. All these guys behind me finish them off in two shots. Then when these guys pop out, finish that wave in two shots as well. So we are down to four shots now. Gonna come up here, pull out the shotgun as these guys fall down, walk back a bit just to get them grouped up. Do this with the other waves as well. Ah, oh, that's unfortunate, I missed one of those guys. Uh, okay, whatever. <laughs> All right, now we have a mini boss to deal with, as usual. So uh, it's kind of weird. Uh, uh, hello? Okay. Uh, I was, I was trying to use a heat move, but uh, apparently that's not allowed. Oh boy. Uh, but yeah, dagger heat move and a bit of a combo, and this guy is done. Man, that was, that was interesting. I'm not really sure what happened there. Usually what I would do is use... Th there's the floor heat move where you can just kick the guy on the floor. Uh, for some reason, it seems you can only use it with the knife. But sometimes even having the knife out doesn't help. Uh, so what can you do? All right, down to six shots. Right here, we're going to have uh, a, this really long room with a knife thrower at the end of it. So we don't want to get interrupted during our shooting. So we're going to run behind him and start plugging away at enemies right here. I only have one shot, so another shotgun for the next fight, I guess. Um, we're gonna have a QTE here. One thing you might see me do every now and then is wiggle the analog stick a bit before a QTE is coming. That's because this game's PC port has a really nasty habit of switching the, display, the control display to keyboard and mouse, uh, which can really take you off guard, um, catch you off guard. Um, yeah, I've, I've definitely lost a lot of time to messing up QTEs that way. Uh, as you can see, this guy is Majima's greatest fanboy. Uh -huh. uh, I'm going to avoid his first fan. Hopefully, yeah, get the heat move off before he throws his next fan. And hopefully this 
combo finishes him off. Yes, nice. Okay. He was well behaved that time. Okay, and now um, to, to cap off the chapter, we have a very special boss fight. Does anyone want to say a few words about Sarah and his significance in these games? Yeah, uh, Sarah here, leading the Nikio Consortium, uh, he's going to be somewhat of an important player at the beginning of Yakuza 1, question mark, uh, for all about five minutes. Uh, but in terms of the events of this game between this and the next game, Sarah running the Nikio Consortium is going to become the Tojo Clan chairman uh, here through the actions of this game. But he's going to become one of... Frankly, in the run, not that frustrating, but in terms of this game, Sarah's actually one of the nastiest bosses. In the I'm ultimate climax battles Sarah that you can do on the main title screen, he has a counter that is really annoying, and he is on max aggression when you're like a low-level uh, Majima in that fight. So, thankfully, in the run, he's not quite as aggressive, but he can bring that counter out if, um, if we get a little unlucky. Yeah, so that that ultimate climax battles form of Sarah is very very bad, um, but even in the regular game and even on easy, his second phase is super nasty. Uh, oh, that's really bad. <laughs> yeah, this is very unfortunate. So yeah, we're gonna have to deal with second phase Sarah. So I'm just gonna let this guy speak for himself. But uh, yeah, he is. Um, okay, it, it seems like he's giving me a bit of a break here, so he's not as bad as he could be. But you, you just saw that kick there, he can use that to interrupt your combos and cost you a lot of time. Uh, that ended up being an okay Sarah, actually. Ideally, you would just uh, do one swipe after the QTE when he's already on 1 HP, but that wasn't too bad. And okay, at this point, we're back to Kiryu. So... Oh. So uh, we're now in Sodenbori with Kiryu, which is interesting. And when you're in one character's city with the other character, um, there's no Mr. Shakedown, there's no sub-stories, um, but there are still regular fights, although at least for Kiryu and Sodenbori, regular fights are pretty rare. I mostly see just the harassment fights that you need to interact with on your own um, to trigger them. You, you do still see regular fights every now and then, but it's not super common. So yeah, at this point, we are looking for leads on Magato's whereabouts. And Date, uh, for some reason, tells us to go meet him at the video store instead of just walking with us to the video store. This is, I guess, another one of those times where the game wants you to explore, but there's really nothing for Kiri to do in Sodenbori that he can't do equally well in Kamurocho. You can do all the minigames and stuff like that, but um, really n nothing that you can't already do in Kiri's part of the game. Um, but yeah, we're going to taxi over to the video store right here. And maybe, Rube, do you want to explain the rest of the uh, speed deck that we use to skip these waiting sections? Yeah, sure. So, this is the longer version of the two. Uh, the one in Chapter 5 was only 5 minutes long. This one is 15 minutes long. Oda says something to the lines of, Hey, Kiri, you should probably go get some lunch. Uh, and Big No-No is Big No-No saying, you can actually like do most of the activities here in Sotenbori. Bar one, karaoke. When I first started running this six years ago, I wanted to do karaoke in Sotenbori in this bit, because, you know, 15 minutes time wait. You know, I've got plenty of time. I can do what I want. Uh, Kiri goes over to the karaoke place and says, I don't recognize this place, so I don't want to go in. So... Oh, also, remember what Big Nono is doing here. We'll come back to this in a second because it's very important. Um, but I was very mad that I couldn't do karaoke, so I did the next best thing. Disco. When I finished that run, uh, the chapter was seven minutes slower than my previous run. Why seven minutes? What did I do differently? 
Well, I went to do disco, and that's how I figured out, actually, mini games constitute a different period of time uh, that you actually use up in the time waiting segments. However, what you saw Big Nono do there, and this is very important, Big Nono went to Higushi Kaikan, which is where obviously when Lee's van exploded. Kiri makes the impression that this isn't related to the empty lot. We know it is, but the more important thing is that's one of two triggers around certain boy. The other one is next to the Grand, and even though the one, the one near the top of the Grand is close to the taxi, it has a longer cutscene to get through, whereas the one down at Gushikai Kan is just text. You need to get one of those two triggers, come up to Club Sega, play Space Harrier once, play Space Harrier a second time, and as you'll see here, there's the pager, and that is 15 minutes of real-world waiting skipped. Yeah, very, very nice speed deck. Um, it's It's... It's not flashy, but it's a big time save. It, I've never been happier to find like a bit of speed tech in any speedrun other than this one, just because of the sheer amount of time that it actually saves. Yeah, and it's one of those instances where we, we kind of tried applying, or rather, Froob and uh, other runners have tried applying the same two games like Dead Souls and others that have waiting sections, uh, and I think to no avail. But yeah, um, you know, we, we've been we've been going through Yakuza. We've been doing all these um, brawler beat 'em up fights, and you know, it's it's probably gotten pretty boring at this point. So um, now we're gonna do what people really come to the Yakuza games for, which is apparently uh, really really long shooting sections. Uh, this shooting section is not the worst one in the Yakuza series. Uh, that's, that honor is reserved to the very first PS2 Yakuza. Uh, oh, but boy. it is pretty bad. But to, to a large extent, because unlike the one that we'll see in K1 a bit later, this shooting section does not allow you to use keyboard and mouse controls, uh, which makes this a bit awkward. And on Legend, this is actually pretty scary, because uh, a lot of these enemies on Legend will actually one-shot you. But yeah, um, uh, interesting. Also, uh, Sorry, go ahead. Um, what's important to note is, um, if you want to deal optimal damage, you might think that you need to go for headshots here. But um, actually, the middle of the circle that you uh, see here, for example, is the weak uh, spot, so to speak. So you actually have to go for the neck, kind of. Yeah. And all Which is... Go on. Go if ahead. you are playing on uh, keyboard and mouse, you have to aim with WASD. Yeah, which, uh, man. Yeah. That's uh, going to be an experience. Say, Ooh, that's really bad. As you can see with the vans as well, and this is a great tip for the harder difficulties, you don't have to deal with the guy with the shotgun. You can literally just deal with the guy in front and then the driver. And there's going to be something very similar with the last opponent here, right? Technically, Boss, quotation marks. Yeah, a lot of enemies you can just ignore in this section. Uh, also true in general for Yakuza, for Yakuza set pieces, you really don't have to fight everyone, as we will see later today. Uh, this QTE is actually faster to fail because it does very little damage, and if you win, you get if you succeed, you get a very long animation. Uh, on Legend, you can't do this, by the way. On Legend, if you fail that QTE, that's a game over. Uh, one thing very briefly I forgot to mention about uh, this segment. If there's one enemy in particular, not don't quite remember which one it is. If you kill them too fast, the camera can glitch into the ground and you cannot shoot until it fixes itself. I have had this take over a minute to fix itself, so that's unfortunately something that can happen. <laughs> Yeah, that the, the camera can be really, really nasty in that shooting section. Uh, in that sense, Kiwami is also a big improvement. You can you can have some weird camera issues with Kiwami as well, but it's much, much more rare. Okay, now we have a bit of a set piece to round this chapter out. 
Uh, these guys are why I wanted to have a bit of ammo in my shotgun uh, from the end of the last chapter. Two rounds is optimal to take these guys out. And um, now we have this fine gentleman to deal with. Who again will not respond well to shotgun. So we're going to do something a bit different here. Alright, so uh, use this time to equip a new shotgun, grab this man, toss him towards these barrels, hit him once, twice. Uh, that's not good. Okay, usually you would hit him twice, but he blocked for whatever reason. Oh my god, well, uh, this is very bad. Yeah, I'm actually going to have to get the barrel from all the way over here. That's. Uh, that's very bad. I'm also not going to do as much damage because I'm not in Golden Fist. This is really bad. Luckily, I got the stomp in, so that's a bit of a bit of extra. This QT uh, also does some damage, so we we might be fine. Kind of depends on how he behaves. This run, this run's been uh, something else. <laughs> This run's been interesting. All right, dodge away, because that guy can be a problem. Uh, Kiri, can you please shoot the guys? Thank you very much. All right, four shots. That's fine for the beginning of the next chapter. Don't do that. If you press start too early, it shows you the breakdown of uh, why you got the amount of money you did from the fight. And I, I just got a bit too trigger happy there. But okay, that's the end of chapter 13. And now we're going to have a bit of a a bit of a preamble before the next fight. So does anyone want to give us a recap of what happened with Oda at the end of chapter 13? Yeah, unfortunately, as it turns out, Oda's not that good of a guy. Um, so, lo so long story short, I don't actually know if we mentioned all of this. Uh, Makto owns a part of the land, or owns the land of the empty lot, which is why everybody's after her in terms of, like, obviously the lieutenants and stuff. But more important than that, Makoto is Tachibana's sister. And unfortunately, Oda is not a nice person. A very, very long time ago, Oda tried to sell off Makoto, which is what caused her blindness. And when Oda saw her, he knew. So Oda tries to kill off Makoto, but at the end makes a heroic sacrifice to... Basically, stop Shibasawa so Kiryu and Makoto can get away. And then we're just going to lead into this bit here, where unfortunately, a assassin by the name of Lao Gui is going to turn up and take Tachibana away. And yes, Lao Gui, uh, as it turns out, is actually... actually plays a pretty big role in this story, uh, but we'll get to that a bit later. Um, right now, we are going to... Uh, Go into a fight called uh, I, I call this the check out my abs fight because I mean check out their abs. Uh, th th there's a bit of a fake out here where long long time fans of the series would think that Nishki really is going to betray Kiri here, but it turns out that he uh, actually going to help us. Very nice. Oh yeah, of course, of course we get a quick aggro in this run. Uh, yeah, we finish off this guy with the bike. A Two light heavies should do it. Uh, if I can actually get them to connect. Alright, that was a very good fight. And it's... Uh, I actually should have used that uh, equip menu to also learn the last upgrade that we're actually going to get during this run. Oh, here's an, a, a good chance to use catch confetti. But yeah, there's one more ability that we need for the rest of this run called Essence of the Beast Torment. We actually saw that one during the um, introduction of Beast Style all the way back in Chapter 2. It's a very, very strong counter heat move that we are uh, actually going to be using in the fight coming up. But we'll talk more about that uh, when we get to there. So Lao Gui that we encountered before actually 
um, actually took Tachibana, and now Tachibana is being interrogated by Kuze and his guys. And Elder Chen here, the same guy who didn't let us stay in Little Asia before. Um, he managed to track down where they're keeping Tachibana, so we are going to go there. And we are going to deal with Kuze. Those keeping track at home, this will be the fourth time, and not the last. This is also another one of those times where you have a very specific um, path you can you should walk. Uh, there can be some really nasty fight spawns on the way to this fight, including Shakedown sometimes. Um, at least I'm pretty sure Shakedown can show up here. But uh, no, we got we got a clean uh, clean run to this building. And coming up, uh, yeah, this is some people's favorite moment from this game. So enjoy. Nice. Alright, so, Essence of the Beast Torment, like I said, is a counter heat move. Specifically, it can only be used when you're on the third heat bar. Uh, it also takes a, a bit of time to actually go into effect, so uh, we're just gonna sit back and let Kuze wail on us for a bit. There you go. And the cool thing about Essence of the Beast Torment, as you can see, not only does it do a really nice amount of damage, it also is good for positioning. Now we have Kuze um, in a really good position behind all of his goons, and I would like him to hit me again. Very nice. Very nice. Oh, and this is actually going to be really good because he's going to land right next to this table, which is one of the most powerful weapons in the game, believe it or not. It does... Even, like, all furniture that have the, um... Oh, my God. All right, well, never mind. <laughs> never mind. Uh, yeah, all the furniture that have the light-heavy, the, the overhead swing that I mentioned, all of them do a lot of damage. That one in particular, I don't know why, just it does even more damage than all of those. It's very, very good. Also, Kuze didn't like the table, understandably. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. But, uh, yeah, okay. Back to Majuma it is, and I will want once more a shotgun with at least three shots in it. So, uh, clerk. And kind of, we, we kind of go through a similar path here with Majma, to the one that we go with Kiryu in Chapter 2, where we're trying to find uh, information, this time about Makoto. I, I, I have some uh, bad memories from that particular fight spawn. People who, people who um, have been watching my streams will remember. Uh, so I got a bit, a bit gun shy there. Oh, no, please, no, get away from me, sir. I don't want to deal with you. So, yeah, um, we went to the Champion District looking for some information. Didn't really find much. Uh, and you may remember that Majima was banished from the Yakuza, specifically from the Shimano family. And these Shimano family guys, they see us walking around, and they're, they're really not too happy about it. So we are going to have to deal with them. Uh, you can probably guess the method by which this will happen. Having a nice chat, right? Yeah! We, we can always settle it. Um, we can always settle things rationally, I believe. 
But uh, the, the funny thing is that another wave of Shimano guys show up and they actually just want us to have a nice chat uh, with Shimano himself. Who you, you get a really badass cutscene of him just eating up this whole tray of fugu in one go. Uh, sadly, we don't get to see Shimano in this game, but we will see him later in Kiwami and... Uh, it's something. You, you do not want to miss Shimano in Kiwami. Coming up, we're going to have a bit of a boss rush. A, like a mini boss rush in this chapter, so I'm switching over to the dagger. And you may you may recognize the man here. And actually those of you who are who really pay attention to Sirius might also recognize the location where we fight him. So yeah, we're just straight up going to fight Kashiwagi, which is the only time this happens in the entire series. Kashiwagi is one of those Yakuza higher-ups that uh, you never actually get to fight, and this entire chapter is a bit of, uh, I guess, fan service in terms of the fights, um, of the boss fights it has. <laughs> I always love that uh, Kashiwagi is so badass in this. Anyway, Kashiwagi is another one of those guys where their their second phase is just extra horrible. So we want to deal with him by working him into... I tried working him into the corner, didn't quite work. That's fine. Uh, hopefully, hopefully I can knock him down here. Oh, I'm stuck on the corner. No. Okay. Ooh. All right, if, if we can get a third combo here, that would be really good. Nah, that's hoping for a bit too much. This QTE is really, really quick. Um, and as we've explained before, QTEs on Legend difficulty are even faster. So in Legend, it's just so, so hard to... Oh my god. I'm going to have to equip another dagger. Um... In Legend, it's super, super hard to get that QD, and if you don't level up your health, um, it, it takes off, like, is, is it seven-eighths of your, health, of your uh, health bar? Yeah. Yeah, it's really bad. Uh, I run Legend in this game as well, and, you know, I'm, I'm deep into my 30s, so I've pretty much given up ever having the reaction speed to nail that QD again, so I just always heal when that QD starts up. Like, I, I know I'll never succeed it. Uh, next up, we're fighting Nishiki, which, uh, yeah, this, this fight is interesting, because Nishiki, again, like most of the bosses, has a second phase. <laughs> uh, the problem with Nishiki is kind of the opposite of the other bosses, where rather than having trouble, we're... Put it this way, uh... It's actually sometimes really, really difficult to get him to get to his second phase, but I think he's doing it. I think he's doing it. You could just grab me, please. That is... Okay. If you're wondering why Big No didn't attack there, that's a counter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes Nishki can bug out and just not do... Oh no, come oh. on. <laughs> oh... Ideally, you wouldn't see this QT. Oh, uh, yeah. All right. Fun fact, if you fail this QT, Nishki gets a heal. Oh, man, this is, uh, this is, uh, this is some real marathon luck going down here. It's funny because, yeah, sometimes Nishki will bug out and just not begin his uh, second phase for a really long time. Runs have been lost to that. You can, you can lose, like, 30 seconds to that happening. Uh, this time he gave us the second phase, but then he gave us uh, an extra QTE we don't usually see as well, so you can't win. It's it's speedrunning. You're going to lose no matter what. I've actually lost a minute and a half to that in the past <laughs> on PS4. Like, no joke. There should be something that we should say as well. Um, all the speed tech that we've done in the run as well, completely doable on every version of this game, even the um, Japan-only PS3 version. 
which uh, s- someone should speedrun that at some point. Uh. <laughs> I've actually done a speedrun of the PS3 version of Kiwami, which was interesting. Uh, man, this this game will probably be like five hours on PS3, Jesus Christ. But yeah, it's really nice that even stuff like Stealth Skip, you might think that's an issue with the PC port or something like that. No, no, that works just as well on any console version. Nothing is really PC specific about uh, Yakuza Zero's speedrun. Uh, but yeah, Fruit, would you like to explain the mechanics of this walking section here? Yeah, this is unfortunately one of the bits that we've just never been able to find any tech for, and I've said this multiple times. I will like, like actually put out a bounty for anyone able to find a way to skip this bit. But if you look in the bottom left, you'll see the mini map where obviously Majima is an arrow or a chevron, and obviously Makoto is as well. When you get more than one arrow's length away from Makoto, uh, Makoto, the game will basically want Makoto to catch up. We walk slightly faster than Makoto does in this section. We're forced to walk, otherwise she has to teleport to us. Whenever conversation's going on, like that one just there, uh, Makoto cannot fall down on the floor. Uh, there are certain parts where she can get stuck, but the other important thing is, and it's a little sad, don't look at her. Because here's the thing. As long as you're not looking at Makoto, when she falls over and gets back up, she will instantly teleport behind you. If you're looking at her, you have to wait for her to walk back up to you. Unfortunately, we we ignore the poor girl. Yep. Also, I I stealthily equipped um, another three shot shotgun for the next fight we have. Yeah, we've, we've tried a lot of things in this section to try and, like, just move faster, just to be able to run or anything, but we are locked into walking, sadly. I've... When I when I came back to this game, I actually did a lot of walking around trying to see if there's any weird thing you can do to, I don't know, get a skip, get some faster movement. I walked around the entire city like this, uh, which takes a long, long time. And no, they, uh... They, they got this one unlocked. They really want you to take in the the romance of the piece. Yeah, generally Yakuza games are pretty well built regarding that. Yeah, we actually, we haven't mentioned this because it's not anything that we can utilize in this run or K1s. But in both this and K1, there are two different out of bounds that we can do at the very start of the run. Uh, with this one, it actually utilizes Sotenbori's map and Shakedown because Sotenbori's map fits into Kamurocho and what you can't see is that Sotenbori is actually on top of Kamurocho. So if you get into a fight with Shakedown, we're out to the main menu and then launch a new game. The game will start, as long as you quit out during the Shakedown fight, will start in a position in Kamurocho where you were with the Shakedown fight overlaid with the Sotenbori map, which just puts you out of bounds. But unfortunately, despite that, there's nothing you can do. The empty lot is completely covered by an invisible fall, uh, and you can't get in there, and then there's nothing to interact with, sadly. Like, it's such a shame. Uh, And, like, with Yakuza 4, for instance, you can actually skip multiple story triggers that... And it's something you'll see in K1 as well when Padkey does that. You have to follow the story triggers, otherwise the game won't let you progress. They are very, very good at keeping you on that path that they want you to go down. Yeah, I mean, we, we um, like all speedrunners, will sometimes complain about the games and how they work, but the truth is these games are actually really well made. Uh, there's very, very little you can do in the ways of things that were not dev intended. And even a lot of things that, uh, that we thought were glitches at some point, I'm more and more inclined to agree that some of those aren't glitches either. Um, but we can talk about that a bit later today. Uh, either way, after that takoyaki run, uh, Magato ditches us, and we track her down to the empty lot. Again, it's it's actually pretty funny. Um, if you want to really get cute with the game, uh, you can 
at, at the part where Makoto asks you to get more, or when you need to get more takoyaki for Makoto, you can actually instead taxi all the way over to Sodenbori and buy takoyaki there and get back. But then when you give it to Makoto, she complains that it's cold. So you still need to actually get it from Theater Square. Um, which is a bit, <laughs> a bit of a weird detail because you would think that Makoto would just ditch you anyway, but um, uh, again, they really want, they really want you to do things a very specific way. Um, since we have a bit of downtime, do you want me to explain the alternative route? Ah, uh, sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, so earlier on, we obviously bought shotguns in the Dragon and Tiger. But there's also an alternative route. Um, I'm not really sure who came up with it. Uh, the only runner I saw Pretty doing sure it was uh, just Sekuro. Yeah. Okay. Um, and for this route, um, we don't do the shotgun sub story that we did earlier in Chapter 2. And um, we instead collect some um, telephone cards. If you've uh, played the game, you know them. <laughs> and um, there's a card collector near the takoyaki stand in Sotenburi where you can trade them for 5 million yen um, and then you can use the Tiger and Dragon, send an agent to the Hunter's Village in Japan and speed it up with 5 million yen then you have a chance to get a shotgun there and that saves quite a bit of time but it's um, obviously RNG dependent yeah you you can't guarantee yet that that equipment search will wield will yield a shotgun. Uh, I've been trying to look a bit into RNG manipulation for that, but uh, so far so far no dice. So if uh, any if if any of you are good with computers, hit me up. But uh, yeah, at this point we are. Oh, what the hell is that? Man, that's that that was special. Also, I should probably equip a new shotgun. They th that was weird. They were like merged with the cart that the guys dragging around. That that was interesting. An interesting fight spawn. So yeah, um, basically during the last fight, we found out that uh, the Shibusawa family was behind the killing of Nishitani. And now they have Makoto up here in the Sebastian building. Uh, she's trying to cut some sort of deal with Dojima. Uh, and um, yeah, Majima's here to to um, come to the rescue. Yes. Uh, yeah, these these guys are like the shabbiest looking members of the Dojima family. Uh, I don't know, a, a lot of gray coats here. Um, really, really, um, someone should, uh, regard the fashion situation in the Dojima family. Anyway, these guys are really set up in a really, really bad way for shotguns. Okay, that was actually pretty good. I, I came up with that specific pattern of movement in the run I did earlier today. And it seems to be pretty consistent. So, yeah. Cool stuff. Anyway, we got a lot of dudes here, so we're gonna need a lot of shotgun. Um, Patki, do you want to say a few words about Big Boy Skip? Yeah, there's a skip we call Big Boy Skip because you can skip this guy. And if you finish every one off before he spawns, he won't spawn. But there is also a threshold where you think I think you have like three enemies left and then he will spawn anyway. So it's kinda hard to trigger or not trigger him, I guess. Yeah, basically the, the win condition for the fight is defeating all enemies on screen and the condition for uh that mini boss um, being spawned is getting to a certain amount of enemies left on screen. So if you can just get through that, if you can just reduce the number to zero without crossing that threshold, 
he'll just never show up to begin with. In all sub stories and New Game Plus 2, I guess, you get powerful enough to where you can get that to happen consistently. It can happen in any percent, but it's super, super, super rare. Uh, Padkey had it once in a run, and I don't think I've seen anyone get it uh, at any other point. Yeah, no one was able to replicate it since then. Yeah, I I think both me and Padkey tried to come up with a consistent setup and just didn't didn't find anything good. But uh what? Yeah. This is this is now the finale and you may think, "Oh, then we are very close to the end." Uh the finale in this game takes like 20 minutes, so we still have a ways to go. Don't die, but know actually, it. Actually, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Don't I know it? I woke up early to finish it. <laughs> that was, I mean, I really admire the dedication of plowing through uh, this game's finale on your first playthrough just, just to be uh, ready in time for the event. That's good. Thumbs up on that one. Uh, but yeah, we're here to contact Sarah. The game kind of cheats you at this point, and it marks every phone in the game except the one in Little Asia, which is actually the closest one, because you actually need to get to Little Asia for the next cutscene. Um, actually, don't don't know. Um, did you find that fruit that you can actually use the that specific payphone? Uh, I did. Yeah, very nice. early on. I I, nice. I think I was just messing around and just walked in. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, as you've seen, cash confetti can sometimes take some time to go into effect. Uh, back when I was a new and very naive runner of this game, I uh, would, would just use cash confetti and keep running forward, expecting it to take effect immediately. Uh, don't do that. That's, that's a recipe for pain. Um, always, you always want to hang back and only start running when you see the the uh, cones of sight turn blue. But yeah, at this point in the game, the Dojima family is starting its final assault on uh, both the Kazama family and the Nikyo Consortium, and we need to help them all out. Starting with these guys. Again, the Dojima family guys just look so shabby. I'm not like I, I'm. I'm not one to criticize one fashion usually, but goddamn, like have a little bit of style. And anyway, one last chance to run into Mr. Shagun, who, to be fair, has actually not been too bad in this run. We've we've barely seen him, I think. Two times, I think. Yeah, both very early on. Yeah, I I think none with uh, Majima. Is uh, uh once a magic in chapter three. Oh, that was very, very far away. Right, right, right. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of nice because like with the end game with Kiryu going to certain boy for a brief period, and Majima not going back to certain boy, there's less chances of shakedown in the end game. Yeah, and it's good because at at that point. Oh, no, okay. My spots are really out for you today. <laughs> yeah, we, we're just praising the game for not being too bad with Shakedown, and I get those two fights. <laughs> uh, love these games. Lo love these games. Don't, don't ever let anyone tell you we don't love these games. Uh, but yeah, here, here's the final, final fight. With Kuze, sorry, I'm still reeling from that. Uh, the final fight with Kuze, where um, we, we're actually going to get a different theme for Kuze. We, we actually haven't talked too much about the soundtrack, but man, the soundtrack in this game is good. It's it's top notch, honestly. The entire series is just just has amazing music, uh, and this is probably the pinnacle of it. And Kuze's regular theme, Pledge of Demon, is Probably my favorite track in this game, but uh, this one coming up, Oath of Enma, is also really, really good. But yeah, you're going. I like this one even more. 
Mm. The original one. As you can see, some physics happens with with that sign over there. We're gonna use this one. Uh, after this, immediate um, essence of the beast torment. And now, having softened Kuze up somewhat, we're gonna use some light heavies. That's one. And two. Another mesh QTE right here. And this one actually does a really nice amount of damage. I think this QTE actually gets the damage buff from Golden Fist. Can it correct me if I'm wrong. And I don't know. And uh, yeah, one light heavy finishes the fight off. And that's it. That's that's all of Kuze for this run. And we get a bit of a dialogue here between Kiryu and Kuze, where Kuze uh, is a, a bit more respectful, respectful of Kiryu. And he warns him that he's about to, you know, re, re, it, it, things are going to get real, basically, from now on. Uh, which, actually, the finale, the finale is one of my favorite parts of the game and the run. It's really, really good, but it's also really scary. Even on easy, you can very realistically die in this finale. And especially on Legend. Um, I, I vowed that the next time I run Legend, I won't get any health upgrades. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's going to be that's going to be nice for the finale. There's a lot of guns in this finale, as you're about to see. Okay, so how are we doing for ammo? I sh should be fine. So at this point, the game gives you one last chance to buy um, healing items and such, but we we don't need it. Items, we're good. Also, check out this this kettle here, this tea kettle. This looks so good. Every time I see this, I feel like making myself a cup of tea. And then I remember that I live in the desert and that that's a bad idea, but uh, the intent is there. Either way. Also gonna have to... Uh, Gonna have to equip a shotgun with Majima. And yeah. Now the finale officially begins. Only good soundtrack from now on. Oh yeah, this this is actually the track that uh, our friend Firelight named himself after. I mean it's a banger. Can you can you blame me? It's very, very good. <laughs> yes, I, I agree. Hmm. That grenade guy can stagger you, and uh, that's a really bad time if that happens, because all of his gun-wielding friends really like to take advantage of that. But yes, this uh, part of the finale is a bit of a throwback to the first Yakuza, where, uh, as we'll see in Kiwami, the remake, there's um, a big set piece on, on a boat in Shibara Wharf. Well, not a big set piece, but there's uh, a, a bit of a combat there. Anyway, uh, coming up here, we are going to come across a mini boss by the name of Takahashi, who um, is, is not going to last very long against us. We're already in Golden Fist, so. One light heavy and a second light heavy. Ooh, okay. I, I guess he blocked most of my attacks this time. So I had to do some extra damage. Still, that was fairly quick. All right. Shoot this big boy right here to get him out of the way. Immediately switch to rush just to go upstairs a bit faster. About halfway through the stairs, switch back to Beast. Shoot these guys. Oh, that's really bad. On Legend, that would actually that would have actually killed me. Ooh, okay. That's that's why uh, it's not really a good idea. 
Wow, how shotgun did that hit both of them? Uh, such a big range. Wow. Yeah, yeah, when you are on the floor as well, you don't have any iframes. If there are multiple gun guys, you're gone. So this is another time where, despite shotguns not doing a lot of damage to bosses, uh, there are three mini bosses here, so it really makes this part a lot easier to deal with if you stagger them. Uh, which man, that that was really good. That's some nice doubles. You yeah. can usually you can sometimes get all three of them staggered with the shotgun, which is better, but that was still really fast. Nice. And by shooting these three guys, we get teleported all the way down the hall, and we're going to switch to rush one final time, just to get up here a bit faster. Switch back to Beast. And that's the end of Curious Part until the final boss. Now we switch back to Majima. Majima is going to go through much of the Dojima family office that we went through in Chapter 1 with Kiryu. Uh, not, not entirely the same, but you can see that we get a lot of the same rooms here. Uh, I think I actually want to switch the sh my shotgun early because I'm not going to have enough shots for the guys coming up. Yeah, I actually have a lot of ammo with Majima. I had a run, of, like one of my last runs, I had very little ammo here for some reason, but I really don't need to be that um, conservative with my ammo right now. By the way, this is also one of the best tracks in the game, Rain. Uh, it's very, very good. Dodge past these guys, don't get shot. Mm. And I'm thinking if I want to try and stagger this guy, uh, no, nah, we'll be fine. We'll just we'll just deal with him normally. Whoa, hello. <laughs> he was going for it. Oh my god. Okay. Uh, at least he's not staggering me, but he's being very badly behaved. Oh my god, stop it. <laughs> oh man. So, if you have enough ammo, you just shoot him twice again to, to stagger him. I figured we didn't need it, but that turned out to not be the best decision. But yes, now we're basically starting a, a boss rush. We're going to be fighting two bosses with Majima and one boss with Kiryu. That will be the end, end of the game. And yeah, as as you've guessed, uh, this is going to be finally our fight with Awano. Here you never gets to fight this guy. That's uh, left for Majima, which is an interesting decision. And they have this big talk here about. Um, what it means to be a Yakuza, and Awano says that he just wants to enjoy life, and Majima makes him feel inadequate or something like that uh, for not being as tough as he used to be. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, obviously. Uh, anyway... It all culminates in people pulling off their shirt, as, uh, as you want to see in a Yakuza game. And the one who is surprisingly buff, you, you wouldn't expect from his face <laughs> that he would be that sculpted, but uh, I guess you can't really argue with the facts. So right here, it's going to be really important for us to work Awano into one of those nooks with all the furniture in them, uh, which can be... Oh, I actually used the wrong combo, I can't believe it. I hit X just a bit too... Okay, oh, whoa, okay, that's pretty good. All right, that's a good start. And now we just want to get a one once more. Don't do it. Don't do it. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Another heat move. Nice. I want the second phase is very nasty. Uh, can you? Uh, man, this game. I don't know why, why Majima just won't stomp today. Very strange. Anyway, this should finish him off. And now we're down to the final 
to Majima's final boss fight, Lao Gui, who we've mentioned before, but we actually don't see in this run, uh, in the run before this point. That's not Lao Gui, that's Dojima. This is Lao Gui. Ignore Arnold's body there. Nothing happened to him. <laughs> it's all good. It's all fine. Um, Lao Gui is easier to work into the corner with the furniture than uh, Awano just because of his starting position. Also, you'll notice that all the furniture is, is back in her place, so someone quickly tied it up uh, between the fight with Awano and this point. Okay, good. A lot of extra damage. Don't do it. Oh, no. Ah, uh, that's... That's unfortunate. Unfortunate, yeah. That's Yakuza 0. You, you can't win. Uh, can you... Okay. Oh. Oof. Majima just intent on giving me a heart attack. Just refusing to pull out the knife. Alright, uh, we didn't get the second combo off, that's bad. This means that we're going to have to deal a bit with Lao Gui's third phase, which... Yeah, he has a third phase, and if you... If you think the second phase of the bosses in this game is bad, third phase is... Uh, <laughs> Although for Lao Gui, maybe the second phase is actually worse, because he has the gun and the sword in that one, which are both really nasty to deal with. Oh, boy. Okay. Got stuck around the corner. That's unfortunate. Oh, man. Oh, man. That's that's about as bad as that fight can go, but I made it. I had exactly enough dagger for that fight. Okay, but we survived. And uh, we are now going to fight the final boss with Kiryu and also uh, listen to another one of the best tracks in the soundtrack, Two Dragons, which is just an absolute banger. Really, really love this one. Uh, anyway, how to deal with Shibusawa. Start with a beast combo, knock him down. Once the heat icon shows up, you can stomp him. Essence of the Beast Torment. And now he's in the HP threshold for his next phase. So we're just doing a few stomps and then a shoulder bash. Trigger the phase transition. It's also really nice the way the, the music in the back changes according to what's happening on screen. Really nice touch there. Don't fail this QT. We need the heat. Dodge his first attack, light heavy. Or that could happen. That that's also Oh, he stole my <laughs> table. <laughs> he loves doing that. He's been doing that a lot these uh, past few days. Oh, that's mm, very, very bad. That's very, very bad. He if he's not nice in this last part, um, we're gonna be in trouble. We need to get him into a specific health threshold to skip a QTE at the end. Um, and yeah, it's going to be hard to get him that way. All right, he's not going to do it. Um, okay, that's why we have safety items. So I'm going to use this and the dagger. Takes a bit of time, but it takes less time than actually getting the extra QT. That's unfortunate. All right, and time will be in um, a few seconds after we finish up this QT phase. So we have one mash QT, and after this we'll have two regular QTEs. So that's one, and time's coming up. GG. 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 Thanks. And yeah, that's Yakuza 0. Uh, love this game. Love this run. Thank you very much.
for giving us the opportunity to showcase it here on GDQ. Um, would like to thank my couch, Cryolite, Fru, Petki for their commentary, their support. Been very, very nice. Uh, big shout out. As, sorry? Thanks for inviting us. Yeah. And also big shout outs. Uh, we talked about a, a lot about stuff that Froob came up with this run. Froob uh, was the initial router for a lot of for a lot of this run. Came up with a lot of the tech. Uh, they love the optimization, but there's also a lot um, that uh, two runners by the name of Kuro and Yuki came up with. Uh, they specifically Kuro, I believe, introduced the shotguns into the route. Um, Came up with a lot of a lot of uh, strats, a lot of tech. So, big shout outs to them. And uh, yeah, I I hope everyone enjoyed that. And stick around because there's a lot more yakuza coming up. We will be back with this same composition, except me and Padke are going to switch seats. He's going to run yakuza Kiwami, and I will join join Firelight and Froob on commentary. Uh, so yeah, see you in a bit.